All right, so guys, just um, as y'all can hear, this is recorded at all times. Um, we do that in case that you have to miss a class one night and you submit a absentee record to us and let me know in advance that you're not gonna be here. So the class is out there to where you can potentially watch it at a later time. And it's also a good thing to go back over and watch maybe before your finals, if there's certain parts that you wanna go back over or at any point in time, you can reach out to uh, Robert and I, and we can get some information, throw it out there on the Discord and uh, get everybody situated. Uh, does anybody out of the 18 of you guys have any questions? Um, want to know anything real quick? Uh, Rob, you want to take over for a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, tonight's mostly just introductions, at least on our part. So, you know, uh, Chris, thankfully, has been with us for a little while now. This is his second class to teach. He's taught before, but this is his second with us. Um, love having him around myself i've been in ems since 2005 i started off as a volunteer firefighter and then um became an emt joined the military became a flight medic and um have pretty much just gone up the career since then the only thing is because i was working at a higher level with the military i never bothered to up my training personally on the civilian side so it was only as about two years ago that I decided to finally go to paramedic school and get my stuff done. I got all the way to the end of the last lap and then COVID squashed it. it just mixed the entire class on me. So that's you got within the last, like you could see the finish line, Rob. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been through the entire course. I was about halfway through my clinicals at the end. And then they kicked us all out the hospitals because they were getting overrun with patients. Um, so yeah, that, that was the part that sucked, but uh, that thankfully based on how our program works that won't happen to y'all um i kind of learned from that one and built the modified it so that that we don't have that issue if um something like this ever happens again no clue what but, i say it say it again oh I, okay you just under no, i think your mic is on let's see i can't control it but anyway um I, I try to stay very approachable. I try to keep an open door policy. I will direct you guys if you come to me about things to kind of go to Chris. I'm not passing you off. Um, it's just that he needs to know. So, you know, by all means, reach out to me. Um, just don't forget to keep Chris in the loop. And if you can't reach him, like you said in Discord, then by all means, reach out to me. And also, um, you know, lean on each other. You guys in the Discord server, you have your own room where you can kind of talk within the class, but you also have the Aries community portion as well. So if you want to ask a question that uh, somebody in a different class can answer, uh, or if you all are wanting to kind of pass ideas back and forth, study together, give us ideas to make things better, by all means. We are still, some of the stuff is new. We just switched over to Zoom. We just started up with Navigate. We just started the Discord server. So you're gonna kind of see things building up around you. Uh, bear with us. And if you do see something that we can either do better or add in, then by all means, let us know. Uh, other than that, you guys enjoy this. Uh, this is the first step. I don't know how many of you guys are EMRs or have medical experience outside of this, but whether you're this is your first day or you've been in it 20 years and you're just trying to change lanes, um, this is a good career to be in. And shockingly, I found out today that the pay scale for EMTs has gone way, way up. So that's a good sign moving forward as well. But uh, y'all have a good night. I'll be in for a little bit, just kind of listening to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And then I will silently exit after a while. Thanks, Chris. Hey, Rob, if you will check the Discord, there's a couple of questions there. I know you can answer that pretty quick. Okay. Um, hey, folks, so listen, so the way it is here is I can't help it. I'm going to let y'all know it'll be, it'll be funny to y'all after a while. I don't know why, but when I start talking, I start yawning. So it's not that I'm tired or being disrespectful. I just can't help it, folks. So I'm sorry. You'll hear me, and I'll be mid-sentence and start yawning. That's what happened to me a minute ago. So I need to go ahead and tell you all that up front. Um, I do take breaks about every hour on the hour. Uh, that is kind of the customary thing that we do here. Um, if you, I mean, obviously it's not like I can see you guys. So if you need to get up and go, just go, just make sure you're, your mic's turned off. You can hear us. If you put the earbuds in, you got to walk around, whatever. That's fine. Just, we, you know, 
you're going to be gone for a hot minute, you know, we just need to know to shoot me a message on the side so we can go from there. Um, like I said, I do things kind of by the book majority of the time. Uh, I go over the slides. I add a lot of things in there. Um, I cover the importance of things. I like to make sure that you know the book. But at the same time, as I want to give you the street answers. I don't want to just be like, oh, no, here's, here's what you do. Here's how you have to do it. That's not the way that I like to do it. I want you to know more about it. There's some things in the chapters. Um, and your numbers as we go through here. So please bear with me. Uh, we'll make sure that you're on the right track. Um, some of our slides versus the navigate didn't match up real well. So I promise you, I'll, I'll keep you on the right track. And if I get off the right one, the wrong track, uh, we'll always blame it on Rob. And we'll, we'll fix it. Um, but I hope we're all going to have a good time. I do encourage you guys to uh, pipe in, ask questions, type a note on the side. Um, I will do my best as I'm talking around if I see that there is a message in the group um, I will read it aloud just so that I know that people who potentially wait to watch this at a later time can see what's been asked maybe that they're not potentially watching the screen maybe they're just listening to it but that's something that I want to you know, just to let y'all know that um does anybody have any any questions before we kind of dive off into the chapter. Y'all quiet. First night, y'all super quiet. All right. Um, let's see here. So uh stand by I gotta figure out how to share the screen thing. Um it's 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 new so I gotta figure this out. I can see it. You're good. All right. Well, well I, I, my whole chat box disappeared. Do you see um, like, like a toolbar at the bottom? I can. I can see it well, and click. And there it, it is. Up. Now I can. Y'all see it on my screen, or is that just? No. Can, no, we can't see the chat. Okay. All right. Good deal. So, guys, I can see. You want to make sure? Okay. I got everything. I'm straight up to you. Uh, I'm an I'm a goofball. I'm an idiot sometimes. So I just want to. It's not anybody's fault. I just y'all y'all will tell pretty quick. You'll figure it out. Um, majority of the time, uh, I shoot I shoot you like it is. I don't hold anything back. So um, I hope ready. We have a good time. I really do. Um, I guess that's it. We're gonna kind of dive off into this and kind of give y'all some. We're gonna kind of do a you know a walk, crawl, or crawl, walk, run uh, into this. There's going to be some parts of this that some of y'all are going to get confused, and that's okay. Um, don't feel like we're expecting you to just know it out the gate. Um, yeah, I told you. I'll start, y'all. Can't help it. If there's questions, please uh, feel free to message through the chat. You can direct message. You can turn around and also send me a direct message through Discord. Um, to go back over what I sent you guys out, our primary means of communication is always gonna be through Discord or email with an instructor or, or Rob. Um, please, and the reason why we do that is we try to keep it a format and formal to where if you happen to reach out to somebody on social media, that's fine, but I can guarantee I don't check it all the time. And if it sits there for a couple of days, I, I don't want you guys to uh, to be upset that way that we didn't answer, but at least through Discord, several instructors are in the same Discord, so we can at least help you as fast as we can. I know Rob's phone goes off pretty good bit, so he also sees it through multiple classes and, and different groups. Um, all right, so diving off into this. Why is it not clicking? All right, so... A lot of your national EMS education standard competencies, I, I just got to say it. I, I got to make sure that you understand what we're going over. Uh, it's kind of like that checklist. I got to put a check in the box. So y'all pick up what we're putting down and it's not just a mute point. So 
all this applies to the fundamental knowledge of the emergency medical services, which is, we're going to use a lot of acronyms for this. So uh, at the time, if it may help, if you take notes, write them down, it'll kind of help you out. So well, later, in, later on, when we go over it, I keep saying CHF, you're not like, well, what's, what's wrong with him? I, I don't know what he's talking about. So we'll consider this into the EMS. So the EMS system, safety, well-being of emergency medical technicians. Now, hopefully by the time you graduate, you all will be EMTs and you'll know the medical, legal, and ethical issues to provision of EMS care. Now, I, I always joke and say this, we need to know medical and legal aspects of what we can and can't do. I expect y'all to have ethical morals and just good standards because that's you, you represent yourself. Uh, I tell my son, there's only one thing in life that you're given is your last name. And don't destroy your last name because that's what people remember you as. So be, be ethical, be mindful of what's legal, what you need to report and what you don't need to report. There are certain things or do you have to get involved in this? Is what do I need to do now that I've seen it? I'll, I'll really know. Well, that's what we want to go over with this. We want you to understand the basics and fundamentals of EMS. Um, so there's in this chapter, we're going to go over the EMS systems, history EMS, you get your roles, responsi responsibilities, professionalism. I joke, sometimes you may not know what's professional for EMT, so you just you. Well, there's certain standards that we expect you guys to be. Uh, we expect the utmost, and not only are you representing yourself, but you're representing uh, Aries as you go out to get onto the ambulance at later time. And at the same time, is just remember, it's like putting your name on your shirt. You're, you're going to represent a company. And, you know, when you get out there and ride with these ambulance services, this may be a chance for you to get a, a, a pre-hire interview uh, that, you know, you may not know it, but they are, they're, they're screening you for a potential job. Uh, we're going to talk about quality improvement and, and patient safety. Uh, that's our main thing is personal safety and then patient safety. Uh, we want to know if every before we go into an area, is the area safe for us to go in? And then the next, where we're at personal and patient safety. Um, so in here, are some of the more this competencies, uh, they do a lot of research and you'll go through and read some of your big EMS magazines. You got Jim's is one of the bigger ones. Um, I can actually remember when the owner of Jim's actually wrote articles in there and now he's passed away. I'm kind of still on my, my age there. This is a really, really good magazine. They keep up. There's several other ones out there that can provide some good information. Um, so they're going to talk about the, the research of an emergency medical responder. Uh, a lot of the data that they collect is some of your super big cities. Uh, Seattle is, big, is a big one. Uh, you got uh, Rescue One that's up there. It's the big EMS system. Now you hear a lot of studies also come out from the AMR company just because they're so big. I mean, that's a huge company. Um, Evidence-based decisions making, um, a lot of that you'll hear that comes from AHA, uh, American Heart Association, on their CPR, what are we going to do versus, you know, 10 years ago, or what, have what we cut out, is, is it better for the patient? Because it's evidence-based research that they try to improve things that make it better for, you know, the longevity of health. Uh, and then the simple knowledge of principles of illness and injury to prevention to emergency care. Sometimes you're going to be like, geez, does he just stop talking? Trust me, I think the same thing sometimes. All right, so here's your introduction. We're going to, the Texas Primary Source of Emergency Medical Technician, to EMT course. We're going to go over a lot of this. Y'all are going to get tired of hearing me until like November, but I hope y'all enjoy things. We're going to have a great time. So we're going to talk about the system of key components. Um, make sure when you go through here, uh, I can tell you, make sure, but make notes. Um, there's sometimes you'll hear me, I'll be like, bah, bah, bah. knock on the desk. That's a good question to remember. I, honest to goodness, yes, I helped make the test up on Navigate. But I didn't look at the questions. They're random. They just pull them out of a question box. So I don't know the question. Um, I can look at the question bank. So I can just tell you what's very important going off of the, the notes that I have and versus some of the materials that they give that's important for me to discuss with you. All right, so 
here's our course description. Uh, team of healthcare professionals, provide emergency care and transport is what, what governs EMS. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, and it's not just you, you as an EMT, EMR, are part of a bigger picture, uh, a huge team. And that goes between police, fire, and EMS. Um, that's, that's At some point, that's going to be part of the family that you're going to be a part of. Uh, you are going to, if you're with an ambulance service or you're with a fire base, you're going to live with people uh, a third of your life if you're on a 24, 48-hour schedule. If you work, you know, a 12-hour system. You're going to be with these people a lot. You may interact a lot with the fire department or even the, uh, the police department. So you're going to get to know this big family and professionals. Um, like, again, I jokingly say professionals. Uh, who's that? But it, that's your job is to represent yourself. Um, so when you complete this, we are going to, throughout the course, we're going to have several different boot camps. We will test your knowledge. We will test your skills. Uh, if y'all noticed when I sent out the big email, I sent a copy of the National Registry EMT skills. I would print those. I would start reading them. I know they're not going to make any sense to you. But the, the sooner you print them, the sooner you start reading them, the better off you'll be in the long run. I emailed them to you. They're also on Navigate. The very first thing you log in and see, they are the very top of the page. And it's something that I want you to print out, read before you go to bed, sleep on it, get it through osmosis, learn these. You will take a nationally registry exam. That is no law. It is a very difficult test. Um, it is going to test your, your knowledge. It'll test your physical skills. And you will also have to do a state examination. Now, it depends on what state you're from. Um, I currently live in Mississippi. I have a license in Mississippi, uh, Louisiana. And, well, and I have an international license. It doesn't really matter anymore. Um, but you'll have to do these tests. Uh, and that, makes it, that means that you meet the minimum requirements of the state that you reside in. And you, and you meet the minimum national requirements to be a national registered EMT. So, and uh, National Registry is the company that kind of overlines us. They see what's going on. And after you pass the exam, uh, you will apply for a state licensure. You will do your hands-on test. You will take National Registry. If you're in a state that recognizes National Registry, you can submit your National Registry exam, uh, your certificate, your passing letter, and, and or your cards, and you will be granted a state EMS license. Some states that don't recognize uh, National Registry, you will have to take a state exam also, just as a, this is just a cognitive exam, just test you the same way as nationally does, but state-based. Um, so most states do have four levels of training. You have your EMR, which is emergency medical responder, EMT, which is what you're taking right now, emergency medical technician, which we offer EMR, EMT, AEMT, and soon we'll be doing paramedics. So AEMT is the advanced. You've probably heard a lot about, oh, I'm an EMTA. Well, it's an advanced EMT, which they're able to do a few more skill sets, you know, some IVs, put some breathing machines down, some people throats and some fun stuff like that. Does get a little nerve wracking, but those are available out there too. And then a paramedic, that is the highest you can go is in the ambulance service. Some places do have advanced medics, remote medics. Uh, it just depends on the service that you work for. Um, and they were, have different different levels, different classes. You got critical care, all that fun stuff. All right. So an EMR is the very basic. So you get CPR and you get a little bit more of knowledge, a little bit more. Now, um, you're not going to be like, you're not testing out for this, but you do sit through a course that is an yeah, emergency medical responder and you can have it. Some rule, I can't say that word, rule fire departments only require you to be an EMR. They may not run a lot of medical calls. They may or they may just be required to have somebody at the station. Or if you guys are already EMRs, you're trying to push your education further and bam, here we are folks. Y'all get to listen to me so we can push your education out. So that's where we are. You're gonna help the, the ambulance services uh, because you're gonna be like a first responder. You'll be the first one on scenes. If you work for a large plant, uh, like Amazon or a gas company, 
they have trained EMRs that work at the facility. And they are the first ones there and before the ambulance and or fire department arrives. All right, so an EMT has a training to the basic life support. So that's where you get your BLS. So that's where basic life support. So y'all write that one down. It's another acronym we'll use later on. You are able to use the automated external defibrillator, which is the AEDs that you see in some of these locations. And you have them on the ambulance. They're just a little bit more advanced. Uh, you can do airway adjuncts, which is like your nasopharyngeal and your oral pharyngeal. We'll go over those. So don't think that you've got to write that down. Remember that. That's going to be at a later time. And then you can help. And when I say you can help patients with certain medications, like you can't put medicine in their mouth. But if somebody's got their EpiPen and they're struggling to give it, you can help them, but you cannot physically give the injection. Like I'm going to put my hand on the outside of your hand and we're going to push this medicine together. You're just helping them. If that makes sense to you guys, you're just, you're going to be that, that helping hand. That's the, I guess that's the easiest way I can you know push it out. All right. So the difference in some of the eight EMTs, and that's just going to be up to the advanced life support. They can do IVs and they can administer a limited number of medications. Now they can't do narcotics. Uh, well, some states, I take that back. Some states allow them to do narcotics. Um, uh, I go off a lot of Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, so if you're not in that area, I apologize. I do need to get more familiar on what certain states allow higher than what the national level requires. Um, so certain different medications, you can also, some services run an advanced truck where you have a, a advanced EMT and an EMT on there and then uh, some services that's all they have a lot of services just run a uh, paramedic and EMT or some places run uh, double medics and an EMT depends on what city or metropolitan you live in they may have that as a requirement or as a, you have the funds to pay for that way um, so the paramedic has a very extensive ALS training uh, we do ET tubes, which is also endotracheal intubations, emergency pharmacology, which means we know uh, drugs, not street drugs. We're not drug dealers, but we, we, we carry narcotics. Uh, we can give an, an array of medication from steroids to help with certain things. Um, I out here have a different protocol than street medics. So I do like out here, for example, I I'm your receptionist to your pharmacist, to your nurse, to your doctor, to I prescribe medications out here. I give antibiotics. Today, prime example, I gave a guy some Decadron and got him on started on a Z-Pack. And I'm praying that he doesn't have to get flown in by a SARS bird tomorrow. Um, and what I mean by SARS is search and rescue. They're the ones that come get our sick patients. And it's about a hour and 20 minute flight to my facility so i'm 161 miles out so i do my best to keep my guys healthy and, and work them um so the emt course you're going to learn several different this is they break it down into four learning activities you'll have some reading assignments uh we're going to do over a lot of lecture presentations um, there will be some classroom discussions um at later points i will post through navigate and assign it to you if I can figure out how to make it assign. Um, I, I'm going to do my best, but we shall see. So then discussions is going to be either open to the group to where y'all can have a educational argument, if that makes sense to you guys. I, we will not allow, you know, telling somebody, oh, you're wrong for thinking that. You know, I, I see your point, but have you thought about this? Or, you know, we run this type of service in our area. Uh, we, we don't allow, uh, EMTs aren't allowed to do that in our state. You know, it's a very educational discussion. Uh, you'll do step-by-step -step demonstrations. You'll do hands-on skills, uh, the skill packets. You'll learn how to uh, splint injuries. You'll learn how to uh, do a tourniquet. There's your yawn. I, get, I don't know why I do it. I drink a lot of water, but I don't know why I'm yawning. Um, so there's an array of skills when I say, you know, skill sheets and all that. You'll have those. Matter of fact, you already got those. And then we'll do case presentation and scenarios. So at, again, at a later point, I'll present you guys with a case. Um, I, through the discussion board, I would expect 
several guys, several guys and girls to rebuttal with some questions. Okay, well, what about this? Uh, I want to know that. I want to know this. Now, a lot of it as I'm reading off the sheet, and then some of it I'm making up because it's off of a, a real patient that I've had. I'll provide some scenarios like uh, you guys are all responding to such and such. What type, you know, and I'll, and I'll get your questions there. So I'll try to keep it entertaining and fun for you guys, but you know, it, it is sitting here looking at a screen, listening to this weird dude talk. So EMTs are the backbones of the United States. Um, a little background, fire service started with just fire. You know, the ambulance was run by the mortuary service. You were put in the back of an, an, an old mortuary truck that was painted white, and they just prayed that you made it to the hospital and they drove really fast. Nowadays, they've stepped it up, you know, the old Squad 51, that's sort of the paramedics out in the field doing certain things, um, calling into the hospitals. I'm showing the age again, if you guys remember Squad 51 and calling Rampart, but that's reaching out to med, uh, med control and wanting to you know, advance their skills. Now the fire service is running EMTs and paramedics because the, that's what the, the curve has made them do. Um, a lot of your fire departments, it is mandatory that you are a EMT, uh, that some of your bigger cities do that. Um, some places pay for your paramedic school. Uh, so, I mean, don't stop just learning because I know a lot of you guys are paying this out your pocket and thank you for doing that. And uh, I hope you continue your education. Um, but just remember, you are a very important cog in the wheel as it keeps turning to keep people healthy and get them to the right services in the right time. EMT provides emergency care to the sick and injured. Well, I mean, everybody knows when you injure that an ambulance comes. But remember this, not everybody sees that EMT or paramedic when they in good moods. So we always go to the crappy situations and people are like, oh, the ambulance people are here. Well, we, we have jobs too. It's just, you don't ever invite us over for the 4th of July barbecue. You only see us at the 4th of July barbecue when Fred can't take a deep breath and ate too much. And now he's car he's going to cardiac arrest. So just remember that. All right. So license requirements. Each state requires different things. So we'll go over general requirements that we also as, a, as an educational place require. It's the same thing as a lot of these states. And if you already noticed, this is what you were supposed to complete and submit to us. So we can have it. So when you go to these places to do EMT uh, ride along, so you got to have a high school diploma or equivalent because it's like going to college. Proof of the immunizations. Um, I know a lot of people have asked. Uh, we've seen this. Rob and I have talked pretty good about this. Um, what is the current requirements on the COVID vaccine? Right now, we're waiting to see. Uh, some places may not allow you to ride because you haven't been vaccinated some places may may not even question it so but we got to have proof of what you required vaccines are uh success of completion of a background check and a drug screen well we'll get to that that's a later date too and a valid driver's license because to work in ems you gotta drive and if you don't have a valid driver's license you, you can't drive so you you nothing to them so remember that. All right. Uh, successful completion of a recognized healthcare uh, BLS cardiopulmonary resuscitation course, which is a CPR. Uh, you'll have to have a successful completion of a state approved EMT course. Ding, ding, ding. That's Aries. All right. Sorry. Uh, successful completion of a state recognized written certification exam. Uh, that will be given in this program and we will take care of that. You'll find out more as you keep going on throughout the program. You will have to demonstrate demonstration of mental and physical abilities necessary to safely and properly perform all the tasks and functions described as defined role in EMT. So you'll have to do a hands-on skill set. You'll have to think on your feet and go with the flow. Uh, compliance with other state, local emergency employer provisions. Uh, each company has their own, so I really can't tell you what they all are because Everybody's going to be different just because that's what they want to do. They're going to be weird. Uh, we do are required are to provide with the ADA, American Dis with Disabilities, uh, pro prohibits employers from fa failing to provide a full and equal employment. 
we can't say, nope, you can't work here because you only got one leg. That is against the ADA. So Title I of the ADA protects EMTs with disabilities who are seeking employment. See, I already talked about it, so y'all know. If you're even missing a finger, they can't tell you no. Uh, uh, may require modifying the work environment or how the job is performed, but you still have to be given an opportunity to work. And then the background checks. We just really want to make sure you're not a felon or, you know, a registered sex offender running around on the Amazon trying to take care of people. Because if you have a felony, you can't be a paramedic or an EMT. So that's the biggest reason why we want to make sure. All right. So going way back. Hey, where's well your? All right. So the overview of EMS. So the history includes... Um, so the volunteer ambulances of World War, and actually even goes further back into that, uh, is into like the in Greek time, where that's where actually they, you know, they they practiced medicine back then. They had these uh, treatment camps, and they weren't called like hospitals or anything. Like they was just a camp, and during the wars or the battles when people come with arrows and you know the arms cut off because of swords, they had to stop it. They would use literally like an iron in the fire to cauterize it to stop it. Um, but a lot of this started coming around from World War I. They noticed there was a lot of death in the battlefield. And how can we reduce this? Uh, it's like tourniquets. If some of y'all can remember. I don't know the age of everybody in here. But uh, you can see the, how tourniquets started. Because if I'll go back and say, I remember when they were like, nope, they're a last resort. You put it on, you're going to kill them. Well, now it's like, man... You put a tourniquet on when you're like, hey, I'm Chris Wally with it. Oh, you've got a tourniquet. So it's those are now they're recognized. So we had field, we had field care in World War II because they used to just have the people that lived in the area go up to you in World War I and throw you on a cot and run you back to a, a little camp. Well, we're volunteers. And you came in with field medics and you had uh, the rapid helicopters and the uh evacuation in the fields and the big red cross and i mean that's that's what where it came from it was just a throw and go uh now people want to be you know flight medics and you know rescue medics and team guys that have you know the pas and the you know all this fun stuff they can teach that now and it's a lot of it's out in the field but where we came from is super important to the history of ems uh, here's some important dates. I'm sure y'all could potentially see these. Uh, the accidental deaths and disabilities is neglig neglig I'm gonna let y'all read that one. I just have a ton lock on that one. So in the early 1970s, Department of Transportation published the first EMT training curriculum. I'm just gonna say that's probably a very important <coughs> statement. Early 1970s, the Department of Transportation published the first EMT training curriculum, which that's one of our governors, governing companies or governing uh, federal agencies. In 1973, the Emerging Medical Services Act came out. 1971, uh, AAOS published the first EMT textbook. So you see, we, we haven't really been around that long. It is just, what was that, 30... A little over 30 years if you look at the first DOT book, you know. So, I mean, Jesus, I feel super old. Um, all right, let's look here. Let's see. National standards, standardization efforts uh, going over again. DOT in the 1970s, 1980s, advanced level EMTs. So, we used to have basic EMT intermediate and paramedic. That was back in the 1980s. So, um, Tamika, what is the code for that will be on the exam? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you can say that one more time. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I had to reread it. Uh, yes, Tamika, that <clears throat> might be a good question. Uh, the 1970s DOT National Standard Curriculum. That hint, sorry. I'm with you now. I'm a little slow. All right. Thanks, Rob. You didn't have to comment on that one. I, I knew you were coming. Um, so in the 1990s, you have the NHTSA 
the EMS agenda for future. They were predicting what's coming. Oh, sorry. See, I got sidetracked. So in the in 1980s, we had the intermediate level. Well, that was around for years. Well, then they did away with it. They were like, nope, we don't need it no more. They're going to disappear. Well, whew, maybe in the last two years, we've had uh, EMT advances come out. That's the same, basically the same exact thing as an intermediate. But the National Registry looked at it and were like, man, we, we need something. There's such a big gap between the basics and the paramedics. Oh, look, let's bring back something we cut out because we didn't think it was good back then. So that's where that, that's the history of the EMT advances and intermediates and where it came from and all that. All right, now back on page. In 2019, NHTSA's and EMS agenda for 2050. So they're predicting, well, they think they're predicting of what's coming. What is it gonna look like for us in the future? Where is EMS going? They gotta give us some forecast so we can either move with it or we can adapt and grow to a different standpoint. You know, I, I've seen in just my, I'm gonna keep saying my short time, and I think that Rob may say something older because, you know, I feel old, but it is things have changed drastically. Thing, easy. Bro, I know. I'm just opening the door. They don't know me yet. Most time it'd have been like, ah, I made all cracked on me. It's coming. So I keep up. myself muted. So <laughs> maybe I should mute myself and just be like, everybody, like, why is it so quiet? So they're making things, they're making plans for us. So you have all these committees that meet with National Registry, you know, the, the NHTSA, the uh, Critical Care Board, all these boards, the trauma EMS and all this stuff, they meet to help try to give us a future. Where are we going? What is in the plan? I mean, I remember when paramedics, it didn't matter if you called because you just really needed a ride to the hospital. We had to take it. Now we can do paramedic, paramedic initiated refusals. They got Uber. You can take your stuff to Uber. I mean, to the hospital by Uber. Bad thing is, is people can't afford just a regular ambulance ride because bad thing is, is just money's not there. And people are actually taking Uber instead of an ambulance because it's cheaper. Well, your standard of care is not there. And that's the reason why we push everybody is, let us treat you. We can treat you on the way to the facility. So the advancements of the way that things are, I mean, heck, we study in the back of a, a, a hearse. Now we got these nice boxes with air rods going up and down the road. What's it gonna look like in 10 more years? Where are we gonna be then? I hope all of you in 10 years are saying, well, let me tell you what my old instructor told me. It would be a great, you know, a pat on the back later down the road if you guys became instructors and took my place and propped my feet up. <sighs> All right, so we got the federal, state, and local. That is, it's the same thing if you look at the, the governmental agencies in your state. So at the federal level, you have your national EMS scope of practice and model provide guidelines. So they tell you at the national registry level, this is what you can do and what you should know at your level, all right? So then the state says, all right, well, okay, we can agree to this, but we don't want this or this or this. So it's a step down. Then you can go to your local level and they may say, well, you know, we're not gonna let you carry this medication that you learned in paramedic school but you need to know that so they tested you on it. It's crazy. So each different level can provide different things. So the state provides a guidance and what you can and can't do for EMS services. Um, like for some stupid reason in the state of Mississippi, every ambulance in the state of Mississippi has to be orange, uh, white primary colors with orange stripes. That is the stupidest thing ever done and they won't change it. Other states, you run red and blues and you can have pink and royal colors and I don't know what all colors, but Mississippi, it's like we're stuck in the 1900s. I don't know what the deal is, but that is a state level. So at the local level, each service has to have a medical director. You also have to have a training officer for an EMS service. You can't just go out there and work on your own. It just doesn't happen. 
I myself out here in, at this facility, I'm the only paramedic for 160 guys. And one, well, two ladies are technically on board right now. I have to work underneath a medical director's med medical number. Uh, the medications we have out here, I have standing orders to do certain things that I can't do when I'm on shore. Okay, cool, no big deal. When I'm on shore, I can't do certain things that they allow me here. So each director writes a protocol. So the protocols are what you can do at your level. Does that make sense to everybody? Y'all are being super mighty quiet. So if you could like let me know y'all still alive, that'd be awesome. Every now and then just say something in the chat. Um, all right, so here's, oh, look, we just talked about it. Levels of training. All right, so we have your medical direction, which is day-to-day -day stuff. Your state EMS, uh, state EMS offices, uh, you have your EMS administration, you have your state EMS officer, you have uh, compliance officers, uh, you can also have people that go out and do inspections. So all these things are wonderful, but they have them at different levels and they provide a regulatory role. State EMS office is also governed by laws and legislative that is made from by your government, your state government, okay? So your national EMS scopes are, uh, let's see how you put that. So it's committees that are, that you pay, like the National Register, you gotta pay them to be a member. Uh, and they have all these, uh, sorry, I'm getting messages out of answer. So, they set a national level. This is what we're going to allow EMTs and advances and paramedics at the national level to do, but your state and local government can also take away from that. So there's certain, uh, like prime example, I learned certain medications that Rob did or did not learn. That's on the national level. They changed it in 20 years, I promise you. They've changed a lot of things. Even though I've learned them, my state may not allow me to use them, but it's the same thing as Rob is able to use those and he learned those at his paramedic training because his state allows it. Well, it's, it kind of sucks for me, but it's, yeah, yeah Rob, y'all see in the chart, in the chat, he says, even as a basic, there's certain things that different states don't allow when you can literally drive 10 minutes across another state line to work for an EMS service, two of them, that they allow you to do certain things. Uh, it, it's crazy, it's, it's just, but welcome to EMS. We will say that is the EMS gods making the decisions. All right, so uh, we hope that anybody here eventually at some point in time wants to be CPR uh, instructors. Uh, hint, hint, Aries can help you with that in your local area. But you have to have millions of people out there that need to know it and they constantly want to know it. And there's a difference between the CPR that is required to teach offshore and versus the CPR that you get at home. See, look folks, we actually need instructors. We really do. We want you to teach CPR. Yeah, see, look at there. You got it now, hint, hint. So, Millions of people know CPR, but at the same time, is are they willing to do it? Just because they're taught to do it doesn't mean that they're going to do it. So that's part of the problem. So even though you hear like, oh, is there a doctor in the house? Well, yeah. Well, maybe I don't need a foot doctor. I need like a MD doctor, you know, that wants to do something. Uh, sorry, I'm having to answer a quick message. Um, and hey, then there's also in the same, students, sorry, go ahead, Rob. If that's students, just send them over to me. I'm, I'm fielding questions and doing tech support while you're teaching. Great. That's why we have wonderful support here. <laughs> Told you our GM is awesome. <laughs> All right. So, and then the same people are taught to use AED. Now it, it's, it's scary. I don't know if any of you in this class has ever had to do CPR on a lay person or somebody that they cared for. I don't know. 
Um, I'm sure at some point in time throughout this class, we'll find out. But doing CPR on a loved one or somebody you don't know can potentially be like, oh, what was that? Well, why am I doing it? It's scary. That's what we're here to teach you more of why you need to do CPR and how to do it right. And there's people that are taught to do AEDs, but they just gonna stand in the back and not say nothing because they don't want to get in trouble. Well, it's easier to do something than to watch a person die, I can promise you. All right, so, so we do have our, what well, they're gonna, in here, they're corp incorporating the emergency medical responders. It's gonna be law enforcement and firefighters. In my town, we have two paramedics that are our police officers. Um, they work, obviously, well, they do two of our shifts, but one of them's at night, one of them's during the daytime. Our city actually paid for them to go. Um, our fire department in our in my town does have EMT basics on every single truck, and that is a city requirement. Plus, they run a sprint truck with paramedics on there, two paramedics on the sprint truck. It's super cool. It looks good for the community, so it's kind of cool. Um, so when they get there, they can help you prior to get in. So this city is like, oh, yeah, look at us. We can make sure things are going. And then when the ambulance gets there, care has already been provided. So the chance of survival is even more important, is even better now because, look, they got these local levels that the law enforcement uh, or the firefighters are doing. So that's, you know, that's very, very beneficial to us, to a service, not only as a community. So we're going to focus on providing BLS and urgent care with limited equipment. The, the police officer may be an EMT basic, but all he's got is like gloves and band-aids. Hey, at least he's out the bleeding. You know, that's important too. All right. So as we go through here, your EMT course is roughly anywhere between 150 to 200 hours long. Yes, I know. Y'all go ahead and shake your heads. I'm sorry you have to listen to me that long. Uh, Lisa, I live right outside of Jackson. How's that? She's asking what city I live in. Um, so you have to know the basic knowledge uh, of the skills of an EMT basic. And that's all the skills that I've emailed you and that's on your navigator. The EMT assumes responsibility for assessment, care, packaging, transport of the patient. Depends on what service you are. You may be... Um, primary as an EMT basic and a paramedic on the truck. And you can do like first responder things, you know, you bandage them, help deliver that baby, do all that, yes, that's the deliver baby, that's a basic skill. But, and then you may have to drive to the local facility. Or if it's a BLS call, you may take that patient to the hospital while your paramedic drops. Um, some locations just have only EMT basics on the truck. So you're gonna have to learn it all. You got to learn from bedside manners to um, taking care of somebody, patient care to the hospital, to doing the report. And then you got to call the hospital and let them know what you're bringing in because you can't just show up to these facilities and be like, uh, surprise. Even though that's what people do when they pull up in their cars, I've always thought that. Just because I'm special, why I got to call you and they don't do it in their cars. All right. So, uh, advances, here's some training ads, knowledge and skills. They'll do IV therapy, advanced airway adjuncts, administration of limited number of medications. Um, paramedics, we, uh, I actually did a lot more than 1300 hours because that was also part of, uh, I have to do ambulance rides, hospital times and all that. Rob, I'm sure he did just as much or as more. Um, each, each place requires different quantities. Um, training skills because the wires ALS, as you can see there, that looks like the military. So they can do a whole lot of different things and not really ask for consent. You're just made to do it, but they're starting an IV at this time. Doesn't look like it's going to come real well because his fingers aren't including that vein and he's probably going to bleed all over the place. Just throw that out there. Uh, some components of EMS. We're going to talk about uh, the comprehensive quality, convenient care, evidence based clinical care. We talked about this a while ago, efficient well-rounded care, preventive care, and comprehensive and easily accessible patient records. <sighs> that last one's kind of tricky because just because you have access to it doesn't mean that you should look at it. That's ethical reasons. And what do you really need to gain out of their, you know, their medical records? So think about that too. Um, public access, we 
hopefully you kind of have an idea into this of the 911 system. Uh, you have local uh, dispatchers. Uh, you may have city dispatchers that transfer you over to a ambulance service or the the county may answer your dispatch and send it over to an ambulance or even sometimes the ambulance may answer it directly and then send you over to police or fire. It, it just depends on the area and how your state and systems are set up. Um, you have your EMDs, which is Emerging Medical Dispatcher. It is a certification. It is not something that you can be hired as a dispatcher. You have to be certified in dispatch. And then you can also be uh, certified as an EMD. Uh, mobile apps assist people with, lace, with CPR and AED locations. That is, as long as they're registered, they put out there. Um, there's apps that you say, hey, I'm doing CPR. And it automatically counts down. It'll tell you, do, you know, 20 compressions for such long. And then, okay, now breathe. So it talks you through that. The same thing with AEDs nowadays. You take the cover off and it automatically starts talking and you really don't have to do nothing. It's, it's already, it, does, it tells you to do it all. Here's what you need to do now. Okay, now do this, now do that. Um, human resources, Whew. sometimes it's scary when you get that phone number or email, but hey, such as HR, you give me a call. Uh, the EMS Agenda 2050 encourages an environment where people want to work. Um, it is, it puts a passion into, you know, your passion for EMS and it makes it rewarding. Um, the current company that I work for is they, they're wonderful. They take care of us. Everybody always gets aggravated no matter what, but I can say, even unfortunately, I've never met my supervisor, but they always care for you. The, the company that I'm assigned to, like I work for a company, but I'm a third party subcontractor for a company and they treat you like I'm just like a regular employee. So getting that and that, you know, the passion of what you do and what you care. These companies look for that. Um, I can go talk to my on-rig boss right now and say, hey, I need this and this is why I need it. And this is, you know, and he may ask a couple of questions and majority of the time they've ordered it for us. Um, it, it's just really good. They take excellent care of you as long as you have that passion and that you do what's best for you and the patient and people see that. Um, there is burnout. Uh, we will talk about that later on on how to care for yourself and how to keep from that burnout happening. Um, medical direction. So let's talk about this. So I already told you that you have to work for a medical doctor. All right, cool. Got that. So your physicians, they give you permission to work at a level underneath their skill set. Okay. So you're basically doing what the doctor says as he's put it in writing. So you got to know your, your protocol. So the med medical director acts as a liaison. You have you have standing orders, and then you have you know verbal orders. So standing orders allows you to do. It's like a repetition. You read a book, you do it. Uh, you see that somebody has they have slip, trip, and fall, and there's a cut on their arm. You don't have to call the doctor and say stop the bleeding. Put a bandaid over it. Secure the bandaid. It's already written for you. You know that you can do that. Now, the verbal protocols is when you know that you need something, but you cannot do it because it's out of your skill set. Sometimes you have to ask permission to give certain medications as a paramedic. Sometimes you just need that doc to understand is, hey, I, I want to do this and this is why. And it seems like it's going to benefit, benefit the patient. Sometimes they will let you. Sometimes they will say, that is a very good point, but at this time, we're gonna say no. As a provider, you're not required to consult medical direction before doing your, your, your standing order, but sometimes they're gonna wanna know. And if you look at these uh, tiers of protocols in certain agencies that they will say, con you know, consult medical director. Okay, cool. That's fine. I mean, I'm working on need your license. You're not working on mine. So let's, let's reach out and call you. Uh, med control can be offline. Uh, like you see there, it's indirect standing orders, training, some supervision. And then you have online, which is direct phys physician directions given over the phone or radio. Um, even out here, uh, there's sometimes that I can do certain things and just email the doctor and be like, hey, I put this guy on you know, such and such antibiotic for three days due to such and such symptoms uh, stating off last verbal directions you provided. 
um, sometimes I have to reach out and call. Um, we do uh, out here. I do whew, I COVID test every single person that's on this facility. Um, so that's standard. Like I had a patient today. I COVID tested him again and I flu tested him again. I called the doc and he was like, hey, I wanted this done. I said, I've already done it. Here you go. Well, it's because I know and I've gotten the trust and ability from the doctors already. But I still call them. I can reach out over the phone or sometimes I may just say, like, hey, shoot me an email. I'm tied up. Okay, cool. Maybe easier for answer me by email. So the legislation regulations. So you have to have some control of EMS. You can't just be like, oh, it's, it's cowboys and Indians run wild. Nope, can't do that. Mm -mm. Got to have some you know, regulations. So they regulate your training. National Registry requires X amount of hours for EMTs, advances, and paramedics that you're required to get to maintain your license every two years. So the day you graduate, the day that you pass National Registry, oh, let me finish this slide and we'll take a break, y'all, I'm sorry. So the day you will pass registry, get your card, two years later in March, end of March, March 31st, you have, yeah, March 31st, you have to resubmit for National Registry, pay your fee along with your training record because that is, it's legally required. Now, you don't have to really do a whole lot with your protocols besides know them and follow them. Don't go outside of your protocols because then that's called freelancing and you can get a lot of trouble for that. Just follow what the, the rules and laws say. If you want to see change, get involved. Get in part of these EMS agencies. Get in part of your state EMS board. Be a fighting word, not one that's like, oh, they're not going to let us do nothing because don't be that, that old hag be out there and look for a change. So senior EMS officials handles, uh, it's like every business really, it's just running another business. I gotta schedule people to come in and work the counter. I gotta have the people there. I gotta get the money in the, in the hands of my company to pay these people to buy the expenses and to, for the fuel of these trucks. Gotta have it. You gotta purchase equipment. Gotta have money to do that. Gotta have staff. Gotta have a schedule to do that. And then you gotta have a vehicle maintenance program. Same thing we do with our personal vehicles. Every 5,000 miles, you know, you gotta change your tires. Every other oil change, you gotta rotate your tires. Well, these ambulances sometimes run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, I gotta have another ambulance to back that up so I can get it off the street so I can rotate it. That's all what most of the time when you promote through an EMS service, that's what you do. Is you go into management and you learn how to look at numbers and like, ugh, I'd rather just work back on the streets. All right, guys, look, I have 7.01. Let's take 10 minutes, get y'all clean your ears out so you're tired of listening to me. I know, I'm sorry. And I will see you guys back at 7.12 now. All right, see y'all in 10 minutes.
All right. So I'm back. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. If somebody can just let me know in the chat, we'll keep going. Yep. All right. Appreciate it, Kobe. Okay. So back to where, oh, why is it not working? All right. So different types of, uh, yes. Thank you, Rebecca. I got that. I was just sending that to everybody in the group. So y'all will know if you haven't done already signed your syllabus, you can just print the page out or you can sign it on and send it all back to me. That's fine. I uh, just keep them tucked away. Uh, yes. Make sure y'all see what Robert stated. It's also need the tuition agreements filled out and returned if you have not already done so. All right. So, so the different types of integration of healthcare systems. You have the pre-hospital care, which is coordinated at the hospital. Pre-hospital care is continued in the emergency department. And integration assures comprehensive community for the patient health. Okay, so what that means is the care you provide from the scene of that car wreck to the hospital, that is what's coordinated. You let them know what you're coming in with because they get a game plan. They get the right people in the right places at the right time for the ER. That's simple, we think. And then the continuative care of from, uh, I got you Rob, I saw it, it's, it's annoying. Um, so that care that is continued, continued from pre-hospital, which means your ambulance, as you're moving along into the ED. We don't want that to be a gap. We don't want, uh, okay, so let's say we're doing CPR. There does not need to be a gap of care once we, once we arrive. What that is, is just saying, hey, this care continues. Everybody's going to get in there. They're going to take turns doing CPR. So we continue that. So we keep that going, and that is part of the different care health services. Then if you're transferred to like a cardiac unit or, you know, SICI, and then you've got all these different divisions that, that is just continuing the care from the first person that put their hands on you. Then my slides are not changing. All right. So mobile integrated healthcare. So what is that? Uh, so we have methods of delivery of healthcare. Let's say the, it's mainly the pre-hospital spectrum. Uh, you got the mobile integrated health involved with the goal to facilitate improved access to the healthcare at an affordable price. Well, who was affordable price? Because my affordable price compared to yours may be different just because we're different people. Well, I'm a penny pincher. I like my money. So, and then the healthcare provided within the community by a team of professionals. You are considered a professional. From now on, we are going to be professional. We're going to look good, we're going to speak good, and we're going to communicate with people as the best benefit of their ability. Sometimes I do get tongue twisted as we go through this, and I will make words sound like they've never heard before, so bear with me. It just happens. I talk. I get confused. All right. So again, the MIH created an additional training for EMS providers, including computing, community paramedicine, what that allows is it's paramedics receive advanced training to provide services within the community. Community paramedics provide additional services. So what they do is they go out, they're like a mobile, it's a mobile personal medic. Let me say it that way. So they can go out, they can perform health evaluations. They may be able to monitor chronic illnesses or coordinations, uh, obtain laboratory samples. They can draw blood from their house and take them back to a certain point and they're picked up and you know your blood's taken to a facility. And then they may be helping to provide uh, immunizations. Mm -hmm. All right, so Rob's posting. I think we're good here on my end, so I'm gonna bounce out. I'll still be active in Discord. If anybody has any issues, I'll be looking to catch you there. If anybody has any questions, please shoot him a message on Discord. He'll be glad to have us out. He will be in and out, like he said before, just periodic times. You may see that wonderful image pop up on the screen. If not, we can always reach him by email. I call him, I just aggravate him. Um, so there's a lot of places out there. Thanks, appreciate it, Rob, have a good night. That do have community paramedicines that may live in a super rural area. Let's say like, you know, way out in Colorado or, you know, the Dakotas, because it's just so hard to get these people to come to facilities because they live so far out. 
they may send a paramedic out there to do everything and then bring the labs back to them. So it, it helps to have that. Um, different states are looking at these levels to push some education out there and to help take some of the relief off these medical facilities. Man, they're getting so overfilled. People using them as primary care. Uh, so the information systems, you're going to lose electronically, it, electronically, you're going to use electric, electronic devices, and that's going to be transmitting from patient care reports to the hospital, to uh, the main server at your company, or even at the fire station that you may respond, by, that you may report back to. You got to have all these reports. It's, you got to track, if you did something and you don't write it down, it didn't happen. So you have to do patient care reports, which is also PCRs. These computer-based uh, documentation systems are used throughout the world. I use one out here. Matter of fact, it's weird. The company I work for, we use one different for offshore, a different one from um, ground, and a different one for air. And it's like, what? What the? What? Why can't we all get on the same page? It's crazy. All right. So you're going to evaluate. Medical directors is responsible for maintaining quality control. They want to know that you don't just suck. They have to do a skills. They want to make sure you know your skills, that you're worth wearing the patch on your shoulder, and that you're okay to work underneath their license. That's a big responsibility as a medical director. So if they're like, mm -mm, I want to check Chris Wally. I want to make sure that he knows what the hell he's talking about. Because if not, mm -mm, it ain't happening. That's okay. We have to do a skills evaluation and a general knowledge of all the medicines that we use, carry, and have the ability to do. I still have to do stitches for my doctor to make sure he likes the way my stitches look. We do that once a year. Some companies may say, hey, look, we're doing a, you know, a con ed, uh, and you got to be here on this date. Or here's the three days you need to be here at least one of those days. Okay, cool. Um, let's just make sure this is showing accountability and showing that you know what you're doing and the level of care is still high. Um, I see continuous quality improvement. Uh, I'm always used to saying QI, and I don't know what CQI. I'm not used to that. Um, so it has a plan, you know, act, run, do, study. I have always said, see one, do one, teach one. I want you to watch what you do. I want you to do it. Then I want you to teach it to me so you understand it. That's the same mentality as what they're doing here. And you're just trying to minimize errors, but reach the overall goal of the best care that you can provide. And you continue to grow and learn. Don't just be happy with being the basic. Oh, I'm happy. I want to move up. I'm happy. I just like driving. Well, at some point in time, you, it, you may have reached your burnout way earlier than somebody else. So the patient safety, we want to minimize any error that we come across. So knowledge-based failure or skill-based failure is, in, is not acceptable. You need to know and do the best for your patient because they called you to do the best thing for them. They didn't call you be like, hey, I want you to come make mistakes on me and if I make it to the hospital, great. If not, then that's cool. I got good insurance. No, we want you to be a professional, do the best for these patients. Um, as you see, they refers the efforts of both EMS and EMS and personal. Yeah. System finances. Uh, so different types, different services, different things. Some of them may be paid volunteer or a mixture of, uh, EMTs may be asked to gather insurance information from the patients. Um, a lot of it's all done electronically now. Um, you may have to go gain certain signatures from people. Uh, you may have to do uh, HIPAA notifications, uh, and you may have to get a written permission from patients to bill insurance. Sometimes it's already built in there. So if you get a signature from a patient, you're automatically, that's, you just got to get one signature, and that's the right to treat you and the right to bill your insurance. And like I tell people is, hey, I need you to sign here. This is just saying that I gained all the information from you. It's valid, and I didn't make your information up. So that just, just kind of breaks it down there to them. Oh, next. There it is. Uh, let's just say in 2020, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the CMS, implemented a pilot program called the Emergency Tri Triage Treat and Transport. All right. ET3 survives to reimburse EMS systems 
for providing the right patient care at the right time. Set up a payment method for patients transport to an alternative destination such as urgent care centers or doctor's offices or own scene treatment will no longer transport. So what that is saying is that we in Mississippi can't, but some places in Louisiana, we can transport you to an urgent care to relieve the hospital. You just need to go see a physician. Your arm's not falling off. You have an upper respiratory infection. You do not have COVID. I can't really tell you you don't have COVID unless I swab you in the field, and that's not going to happen anytime soon. But you, y'all see what I'm saying. Or I can give you some D50, which is sugar, and get your blood sugar back up, get you something to eat where you'll stabilize, and you're not by yourself. And I can get you to sign this piece of paper, and I'm like, hello. We'll see you later. And you leave because you're able to do that. Um, back in the days, we did that a lot. They canceled it out for a while. Now it's getting back around to it where they're like, oh, we can't stand any more people in the ER. While all these urgent cares are like crickets chipping. Makes no sense. Um, so just to let you know about the education system, a lot of your EMS instructors are licensed in most states. Most EMS training programs must adhere to the national standards. That's the reason why I tell you I have to do certain things. I have to let you know. Um, so you have different programs. You have your committee on accreditation of educational programs for the emergency medical service professionals. That's a big, that's a big acronym. And commissions on accreditation and allied health educational program. So a lot of these programs of value, a lot of these, those two particular evaluate a lot of your community colleges. Same thing as for Aries. They, they make sure that you're teaching what you say you're gonna teach and that you're qualified to teach what you say you're gonna teach. Cool, not a problem. I'm cool with that. And then you have frequent continued education, refresher courses and computer-based or mannequin-based self-education exercises are measured intended to maintain and update the ENT skills of knowledge. We're gonna do that. We're gonna test you. We're going to make sure that you know what you're doing, because when you leave here, not only are you representing your last name, but you represent us. We want you to know your stuff. We want you to be the best in the business. That's the way we look at it. Uh, prevention and public education. That is the best thing you can do in your career is educate. Educate. And I don't mean like what I'm doing to y'all. Educate the people. A lot of time people do things because they just don't know. If you take the time to educate them and show them, they may not do it again. So guess what that means? It's better for your job. So when you go to these, you know, public shows and you show off your ambulance, teach them something. Teach them how to stop the bleeding on somebody. That's education no matter what age they are. These little kids watch you, see you in these cool big old trucks and be like, oh, look, I remember they told me to stop the bleed if I got to put my hand on it. That's fine. You're educating them. Uh, if we want you to see, you got your book there, and then it shows you a little bit of some examples that's in your book. Uh, helmet laws, all the different things that you can do there. Uh, we'll skip that one. Good deal. All right. So the research goes back to the 2050 model that they're looking at. It gives us an idea of what we can do to shape and impact of EMS in the community. What's happening? So you have your evidence-based medicine that focuses on procedures that have been proven useful in, in improving patient outcomes. That lets us know this skill is very good because it has saved 10,000 out of 15,000 people. Well, that's pretty good odds, unless you're the 5,000 that didn't save, but there may be other underlining issues of why that happened. So they do evidence-based. Um, many EMS systems and states consult the National Model EMS Clinical Guidelines for National Association of State EMS. Whew. It's just a review. I can look at this, like NFPA, if anybody knows NFPA, it's National Fire Protection Agency, they make standards. Well, not every fire service in America can match every single standard that they put out there, but it's a guideline. It's the same thing that the National Model for EMS Clinical Guidelines does. They give you a guideline 
for what you can do. Some roles and responsibilities. Always, always, always keep your vehicle ready to respond. Uh, equipment's the same thing. Make sure your suction is charged. Make sure it's plugged in. Make sure it's got the equipment. Make sure your stretcher is actually in the ambulance. Uh, unfortunately, I can say I have left my stretcher in the hospital before. And be familiar with your, your emergency vehicle. Know where your lights are. Know how to turn your siren on. And importantly, turn it off. Uh, make sure you give good information. Be a leader when it's time for you to be a leader. Don't just sit back and be like, well, it's okay. No, gain the attention. This is what we're going to do. You need to sit down. You need to listen. I need you to put your hand there. That's cool. Be a leader. Um, like I always say to some people, if you got kids, it's like being a parent on scene that you get paid for. You're like, no, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is why we're going to do it. Most of the time people are like, oh, oh, okay. All right, my bad. Carry on. And then you're going to perform scene evaluation. Is it safe for me to be around? If it ain't safe, it's okay for you not to get out. Because once you get out and get hurt, guess what? Now, who's going to take care of you? Your butt laying on the ground like the rest of them because you didn't pay attention. Scene safety. Call for additional resources if needed. You want to gain access to the patient. That means if you have to call fire to do extrication, uh, that means if you have to get into a house because the patient is passed out on the floor, you may have to get guess, maybe gaining access. That's your additional resources. And perform a patient assessment. And when you assess this patient, you want to look for airway, breathing, circulation. Do they have a pulse? Um, do I see any bleeding? Do I see trauma? If you will look at your nationally registered skill sheets that I sent you, you will start to see that these make sense. We build off of a building ground and we start, we don't just throw you out there like, oh, surprise, <clears throat> there's everything. I give you the sheets on the front end so you can look at them and be like, oh God. Because in a couple of months, you're gonna look at these sheets again and be like, oh, I remember this. Da -da 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 you're already gonna have a building ground or building blocks when you start looking at these. You're gonna know potentially what's coming your way. And you wanna give care when you need to. When you're just waiting on additional resources, don't just sit there and drop your feet up, be like, hey, they're coming. Don't worry about it. I got them coming. That's all I was told to do. No, okay. get out there and you know save some lives. That's what we're paid to do. That's what everybody thinks we're supposed to do. And when it's time, be that compassionate person. Let somebody cry on your shoulder. Be that listening ear. You, we all have our own problems. We do, trust me. We all got our own skeletons in the closet. But be the person that listens, that wants to help. You want to resolve any emergency incidents. If you can, do stop it. That's fine. Uh, uphold medical and legal, legal standards. That's why I tell you, know the laws. Some agencies will make you know the state laws on, what, on EMTs. That's a lot. It's a lot, but you'll learn some of the basics as we go over it. And always, always, always protect the patient's privacy. That's somebody's mother, daughter, son, or father. No matter how you look at it, you wouldn't want to be stripped. You wouldn't want to be stripped and flipped and naked on the side of a highway where people can see it going up and down the road. Do the same thing for that person. Remember that somebody's family. All right, give administrative a support. Sometimes you just knowing, hey, look, hey, bro, I can help you with that report. You're gonna have to click here and here because it's gonna give you an error box if you don't think about it. Hey, appreciate that, no problem. It's helping your partners out. Always strive for to grow as a professional. Once you get to that point, you're like, nope, I'm done. I'm staying the way I am. Don't be the negative, Nelly. Just bounce. It's time for you to go find something else. Always strive to grow and be more professional. Um, always get the, the community relations. I like doing PR things. If I have to work on the ambulance when I go home, I'm always like, hey, don't you got a PR thing? You can go stand at the soccer field. I always get out there and cheer for them. I don't know who they are. I don't care. I don't like soccer, but the people don't know that. They see their interactions of the EMS and like, oh, these people are pretty cool. 
And what can you do to give back to the profession? I'm not asking you to give extra hours or vacation or sick time to your sick employee, but what can you do? Be an active role into the EMS system. Help change it for the better. Make sense? All right. So here's our professional attributes, integrity, empathy, self-motivation, appearance and hygiene and self-confidence. What you see in this picture right here that it looks like a professional, he looks professional. You got that slob that shows up, shirt untucked, boots undone, pants tucked into the boots. He ain't, he ain't brushed his shirt off in three meals and he looks like a bag of, never mind, I'm not shouldn't say that. I don't know y'all that well yet. Look professional. The first appearance is all you get, no matter what. You can't redo a first impression. Represent your company like you own it. That's all I got to say about that one. Y'all see, over time, I have like these, these little twitches I get on. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. my bad. So I can help that. So we want to work on time management. Um, time management, performing or delegating multiple tasks while ensuring efficiency and safety. And you want to communicate, understanding others and making yourself understood to others. Same thing. And they teach in some like these little boot camps that they'll be like, how can you be a better communicator? How can I be a better, you know, supervisor or boss? They teach you these things and all these little, these wonderful classes you have to attend. Yeah, I've got my sarcasm there. Teamwork and diplomats. Dip diplomat, uh, be able to work with others, knowing your place within a team. Communication while giving respect to the listener. Don't try to overtalk somebody. Listen to your patient. Let them answer the questions that you just asked. Give them one question. Let them answer it. Give them another one. Um, hold others in high regard of importance. Understand that others are more important than you. You're not the center of attention. You don't hover to put your pants on. You put your pants on the same way I do, and I'm not any better than you. I've told doctors that many a time. And you want to constantly keep the needs of the patients at the center of the care. You are the most important thing to me right this time. You're safe. You're in my truck. I'm taking you to the facility. You are my number one. And you may not have to just give them a hug and tell them that. But And then pay attention to the close details. Make sure that what is being done for the patient is safe as possible. Don't cause any harm to them. All right. So every... Whoa. Sorry, my email came through from work. All right. Most patients will treat you with respect. Give the respect. Give it and let them give it back. Every patient is entitled to compassion, respect, and the best care that you can provide just because you are in a crappy mood and you and your, your significant other got into a pissing match before you left and you're aggravated and now you're going to take care of this woman that just had a baby and she's having postpartum. And you're just like, oh, my God. No, that's no. You got to give every single person the utmost compassion. EMTs are bound by patient confidentiality. You can't run calls then go to a party and they're like, oh, let me tell you what happened to this. Somebody may know them. You've broken HIPAA and you can go to jail for that. And there at the very bottom, be familiar with the, the Health Importancy Portal and Accountability Act. That's the HIPAA Act. That is big. You need to know what HIPAA stands for and that that is the most important thing that you're required to do is confidentiality. Even if you respond somewhere and you take care of a friend's family member and that friend shows up and be like, hey, what happened to my aunt? Bro, as much as I'd like to, I can't tell you nothing. Sometimes that's hard just to be <clears throat> that guy and just tell him no. I can't tell you. Sorry. All right. So this is the end of chapter one. You will need to write this code down. This code is AMQ390. The importance of that is that you will have to go to our website and submit an attendance for tonight. This is the code for chapter one. We have to do two chapters tonight. I know you don't want to hear me. I got it. We've only been going for an hour and 37 minutes. It's not too bad. Sometimes, wait till we get to pharmacology. Y'all are going to hate me because I love it. And it takes me literally four hours. Y'all are going to have to tell me to stop talking. So I, oh, hang on. Let me write this down in the chat. So I think I'm supposed to do that anyway. AMQ390. So you have to submit that. 
off our website. I'm gonna say that again. So this is your attendance record for this class. I am going to hit escape. Don't go nowhere. Uh, I have to change to the other one, wherever it's at. Stand by, y'all don't go nowhere. All right, can everybody see this one? It says chapter two, workforce safety and wellness. I'm gonna yeah. show my age, everybody's like Bueller. All right, thank you, whoever said that. I can't see it, I just hear it. Thank you. You're welcome. Over time, over time, I hope to start learning some voices. I'm really bad at names. So that's why I had to look at the chat and be like, oh, okay, see you, Kobe, Lisa, thank you. So. I'm sorry. I go by Wally. Just to let y'all know, don't call me Chris because there's like 7,000 Chris's out there. So I ask a lot of questions. This one's going to be a little bit longer than chapter two, but hopefully I didn't bore you too much with it and we kind of taught you something on chapter one. Um, as I'm talking about this, each night you will have to take a chapter, it's a chapter quiz. So when I say exam, it's not, you will take a chapter quiz and then you will take a module exam. If y'all notice on the schedule, you have different modules. And it tells you what classes are, what are involved in the modules. Um, on your test, uh, your night, and I call it nightly test, I gave you 30 minutes. I think there's only like 10 questions per chapter. So it's not like a lot. Your final, you'll get 60 minutes. And, oh, sorry, your chapter, you get 60 minutes and 50 questions, I think I put it that way, because there's different tests, different chapters in there. Um, but those tests will not open, and I mean unlock, because I have them all locked for the ones that you've been in to navigate so far. You can see your chapter quizzes do not open until 10 o'clock the night of the class. So you have to listen to the entire lecture, and then your class opens. You only have three days to take the test. So after tonight, the class will lock and close on the 10th at midnight or 11.59 is when I have it set. Once it's locked, that's it. You don't get a retest, okay? You just kind of, you have to submit a very long essay to me of why and how and what and then it goes to our board to see if we want to unlock the test for you. Does that make sense to everybody? I know it sounds like a lot, but I have to have some integrity in here. Okay. Quick question. Yo, where you at? Talk to me. How many times can we take the uh, quiz? Well, I have it locked for once. <laughs> uh, so that's the reason why, you know, you got to... I think you're gonna do fine. Don't don't feel like I uh, like go. Oh, I need 15 retakes. So we only allow uh, one retake a module. Does that make sense? Is that cool? Whoever asked me, I'm sorry, I can't see the two. Yes. Yes, it's cool. It's cool. Um, so and it's not to we. If I let you take it over and over, you're gonna see the same questions over and over. And same time as I want y'all to do your best no matter what. But I gotta I gotta kind of want y'all to. I want to see y'all improve okay so i think y'all will do fine just don't don't get in a hurry they're simple questions i go over everything that's on these tests like i said i can't see the questions so i don't really know but i know uh, if for some odd reason that the attendance record does not submit on the website for some odd reason it has a gremlin in there and it's just going to do what it wants to Provide all the information that's on that sheet in an email to Rob and CC me on it. The attendance stuff always goes to Rob. He keeps track of that. So if for some odd reason there's a problem and it won't submit or it keeps throwing issues, you don't have to worry about saying it in Discord. Provide it in uh, an email form to Rob and CC me on it. Because if there's ever an issue, then I can go back and look later in the email. Uh, Stand by. Yeah. 
So I just had to answer another message. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about work safe, workforce safety and wellness. Not talking about yoga or nothing like that. Oh, come on. Slide. All right. Hey, did I answer everybody's questions? Anybody else have any other ones? I'm sorry. I got kind of off out there. We all good there? Okay. All right. Good deal. I'm just, like I said, I just try to make sure y'all are still alive and listen to me and not just have me on like playing in the background while y'all are actually doing something cool. All right. So going over this again, I've got to do, there's certain slides that I just have to say, y'all will see this and hear this throughout this because I hate doing it sometimes. All right. So medicine applies the fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transport based on assessment findings for an acute ill patient. Infectious disease, I think we all live through that. So I think we kind of understand that very well. It's how to decontaminate equipment after treating the patient. Uh, assessment and management of how to decontaminate the ambulance and equipment after treatment of a patient. Uh, being prepped, everybody wants to be prepped. Apply fundamental knowledge of emergency medical services, system, safety, well-being of emergency, medical technician, medical, legal, and ethical issues. <clears throat> I think you already heard that one. Work face, work for safety and wellness, standard safety precautions. You have your PPE, personal protective equipment, stress management, dealing with, die, with death and dying, and prevention of response-related injuries. Uh, work for safety, uh, prevention of work-related injuries, lifting and moving of patients, disease transmission, and principles of wellness and restless, resistance. Uh, to take care of others, we must know care of ourselves, how to recognize of hazards, personal neglect, environmental and human made, and mental and physical stress. Huh. I joke at that one lately because uh, I've only been out here a week now and I've already worked like almost 180 hours. So <laughs> stress, come on, folks. We all had that stress all the time. And then we're going to get into EMS. Welcome to the life. No sleep, no more. All right, health is a complex interaction between physical, mental, and emotional connection. We know that if we're not good with ourselves, we're going to be all worn out. We can be snippy at each other. Uh, somebody can say something. You'd be like, what, bro? What? Uh, bro, and it has nothing to do with you. I am uh, my, my. So, and you got to be in physical shape. You do have some of these unhealthy individuals in the world. Every job has them. But sometimes you're just not physically fit to do the job. Uh, some companies do have physical tests that you have to take, you know, like a mechanical, bending over, lifting, you know, going upstairs and stuff like that. <sighs> Excuse me. So you got to have, you got to keep your body in shape, your mental, you know, your mental wellness. You got to have the best emotional connections too. I mean, if you're not emotionally safe and sound, you're, you're, you're no good to your patient because you're unstable. Chronic physical, medical, mental, or emotional stress can worsen or increase the chance of developing health conditions. If you just, you know, if you're not feeling good and you're in a crappy mood, your body gets the flu-like symptoms. You're just like, I don't feel good. But because you, you mentally don't feel good either. I'm not saying that you don't look it, but you just don't, you just blah. You got to take care of yourself. Got to get back out there. Uh, not all reactions to stress are negative. Uh, that's correct. I mean, you do have good stress. Um, I don't really know what good stress is because I haven't found that yet. But you need to de-stress in certain ways. You need to find your your chi, your your place that you can do and relax. If somebody can give me an idea of good stress, please let me know in the chat, or you're more than welcome to pipe in and say, ah, about I'm not a good stress kind of person. I always have crappy stress. So get rid of this stress. Even like I tell people, do something that takes you away from EMS. Because once you get in it, you're going to work, 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 because you love it and you ate up with it. After a while, you're going to be like, I don't even want to look at those, those uniforms. They're ugly. You need to find a hobby that takes you away from your work. I honestly, I hate to say I don't hang out with the people that I work with. I just don't do it. There's one person and 
I love her to death, hang out with her a lot, but I don't, I don't, I don't like the people I work with. I want to be by myself. I want to do something that's good for me. Uh, wellness is an active pursuit of, of state and good health. We always hear about that. Okay, softball, kayaking and painting. All right, moving, taking, uh, taking a vacation. I want a vacation so bad, Chris. It's not even funny. It's funny you say that. I was just fussing today how I need a vacation. Um, you need to eat healthy. Come on, get back on it. Ensure you get at least seven to nine hours of sleep. I don't know who can get seven to nine hours these days. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just not possible. I can take medicine to put me to sleep, and I'm still up at 4.30 every morning. You got strength and positive relationships with close family and friends. You're working. You're creating that stress environment, and it can cause you that gap. Um, building relationships with peers and colleagues. Cool. You got to have fun while you work. Because if not, you're going to hate every minute of it. So get there and find somebody you enjoy. Work. Um, build those work relationships. I incorporate daily stretching and moving and exercise. You need to stretch your back. Your back is your number one thing. You hurt your back in EMS and you are done. Your career is bye bye so build habits of mindful and stay positive. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people resort to alcohol and tobacco. Uh, that is the thing that a lot of people report, respond to. Uh, I was there, right there with it. Uh, alcohol, tobacco, I quit all tobacco, 100%. Uh, so that's years though, unfortunately, it was sucks. So don't, if you don't have it, don't build the habit. Um, some people drink their wellnesses away and that's that's that person but I highly recommend not doing that but I can't make you not dip smoke or chew or vape and not drink we're all grown over the age of 21 um building relationships with peers and colleagues that's that's very helpful it helps you get through the shift like I just told you uh we talked about those minimize or eliminate stressors mm, no comment it's just what the book says uh, change partners to avoid negative or hostile personality. Sometimes it's good. Uh, a lot of companies have crew change. They will do shift bids and change everything up. Fire departments will change and uh, do a complete swap of everything. So you just uh, finally drop nicotine after two years. It's hard. It is hard. I mean, that's like there's people out here on the platform that are trying to quit dipping. And it's like we all just want to pitch in and buy a can of snuff because we're like, you're being a butthead um change your work environment you may want to change your hours it may not be the best time to go to night shift but it may be for your mental health cut back on overtime the bad thing is and like i tell people it's nice to work overtime it's nice to have that extra bump it's nice to work overtime and finally get your vacation paid for that way but when you work so freaking much overtime that's what your life dependency is built on so when you do take off you're further behind because oh i gotta work i should pay this bill well you're never going to work enough to pay it all completely off the way that you're going because your mental health is going to go to crap so don't work overtime as much as you can change your attitude about the stressor and maybe it's just you know hey confronting that person uh yeah joshua sure somebody said yeah that's blame it on take problem. No, i'm just pressing that I get it. First night, you're cool. Don't worry about it. You can listen to my voice later on. We have recordings. I know you're so excited. Sometimes you can seek professional counseling if needed. There's people out there that can offer free help to EMS providers. It's okay to say, I need help. I have lost many, many, many friends because they didn't want to ask for help. It showed weakness. Don't be that guy. Reach out and ask for help. It's, it really is okay. I, I've done it multiple times. I've seen a lot of things in 20 years, specifically working in the States and working in the Middle East. You see some crap you don't ever want to see again. And do not obsess over frustration situations and try to adopt a relaxed or physiological uh, outlook. Make sure this, you know, make sure things are good, but hey, bro, it's a great day. I want you to have a good day. It's okay. Expand your social support system. You know, make good friends, make positive friends. Don't make, well, I know we all get that crappy fan, but don't make crappy friends. Develop friends and interests outside of emergency services. That is very, very important. 
make sure your circle is not just EMS friends. <laughs> and the final one's always funny. Limit your caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. Well, in EMS, you live off of those three besides the alcohol all the time. I'm sorry to say it. It's just what it is. You live off caffeine all the time. Energy drink after energy drink. Sometimes you just be like, oh, I've got too much. I'm I'm having, uh. Y'all know. We've all been there. All right. So we talked about nutrition a while ago. You're going to have the crappiest eating habits that you can imagine. It's, it's horrible because you're going to eat from fast food to fast food to fast food. I'm telling you, while you can, buy you a bag and some containers that will help keep your food cold. Eat cooked food always take leftovers from people it's okay i trust me i have eaten heated up many meals at an er and tried to scarf it down between call to call it's uh, like now still i hate wendy's i hate fast food because of working so much on the streets uh and this is limit you know uh complex carbohydrates are comparable to simple sugars and their ability to produce energy Complex carbohydrates such as pasta, rice, and vegetables are among the most reliable sources of long-term energy production. The energy drinks don't last long. They come through you. They got to come out. And if you ain't built an EMS bladder, you'll know what I'm talking about. You got Your bladder grows because you can hold the pee for so long because you can't stop to go to the bathroom. Sorry, this is my little thing. And... Eh. Lots of tree nuts, beef sticks, chicken breast, boiled eggs, water. That's what I Correct, Rhonda. That's perfect. That's exactly. Uh, <laughs> jokingly, be careful with the boiled eggs working in EMS. <laughs> um, fats are easily converted to energy, but eat too much fat. It can lead to obesity, uh, some cardiac disease, long-term health problems. And then maintain adequate intake. I suggest get that old milk jug. Wash that thing out and keep it full of water. Drink you a gallon of water a day. I drink about anywhere between seven to nine bottles of water a day. I should be drinking more, but sometimes it's just I move so much inside and outside of this platform, I just forget. When I'm at home, I drink a ton more water than I do out here, which it should be backwards. Uh, hey, Rebecca, that's great. You know, drinking too much water is wonderful. I, I'm picky. I like my room temperature. You know, I like the electrolyte, you know, the pH balance water. I know that's a little Gucci, but it is what it is. Find time to exercise. You need to do that good physical, you know, drink, shoot, physical exercise. It's perfect. And, and it says right here, engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate, vigorous physical activities five days per week. Include cardiovascular endurance, muscle strength building, and muscle flexibility. If you just get out and walk. Just do something. Don't sit on your butt on your day off and be like, ah, I'm tired. I get it. I do the same crap. So I'm preaching at the choir, folks. I understand. But you got to get out and move. Do something that's betterment for your body. Um, so here, we're going to go over the National Sleep Foundation. Some of the things about that. They want you to get seven to nine hours of sleep. Half of EMH personnel gets less than six hours of sleep in a 24-hour period. And they all report mental and physical fatigue. Some agencies, uh, if you've run X amount of calls, you can automatically call for a four-hour maximum downtime, um, and that's where you say, I have to get at least four hours of sleep. Some places run you until your wheels fall off. Uh, some short-term effects of sleep deprivation can lead to medical errors, vehicle crashes, and other harm to patients, bystanders, and other EMS providers. So that's the reason why they push that always uh, get your amount of sleep. Increased stress can contribute to sleep deprivation and fatigue issues. I'm sure we've all had that at some point. And then you have your evidence-based uh, fatigue management has been developed by the US DOT. Uh, fatigue sleep instruments should measure and monitor fatigue among EMS. I don't really know what those are because those aren't out there. EMS personnel should work shifts shorter than 24 hour durations because that's what the standard is. But there's tons of services that do 4896s, 2448s, stuff like that. Um, EMS personnel should have the opportunity to nap while on duty to mitigate fatigue. <laughs> I don't know when that's going to happen because he runs it ain't much. EMS personnel should receive education and training to mitigate fatigue and fatigue-related risk. 
now yes but every agency is at fault for not allowing they don't have enough trucks to do that that's the problem people just don't have enough they're always running with the minimum staff you know back and forth so that's hard um so here recommendations to come back feed uh fatigue blah, blah, blah. engage in mental exercise such as having a conversation or or playing a game uh Rica says i know there were very short-handed on trucks and staff every everywhere is short staff i've talked to people from the midwest to uh, a guy i know works at new york fire and new york ems and they are always short uh, a good friend of mine works for la county and and he says if if he would allow it, he could work for 21 days straight because they just don't have enough people. Um, again, be careful of the caffeine consumption. You'll get off the caffeine high and then your head is just going to pound because you think you can handle it. Um, I've got to remind me. It's almost eight o'clock. I got two minutes. I could take another break. Um, and I had to walk away from my computer to grab something. Uh, let's see here. We'll go over this one and we'll take, uh, let's do this next slide too and we'll take a break. 20 minute nap would ruin me for this. Oh, Chris, you're right, bro. Yeah, if I took a nap, mm -mm, cause I'm, I'm done. Uh, we were talking about a, avoid caffeine and nicotine for at least four hours before bedtime and even your phone. I mean, we know that we've seen these blue light glasses help for reasons, bro. I'm gonna tell you, they're out there because you get that eye fatigue. So if you can limit the light show that's on your phone, I mean, your phone, turn it down at certain times, put it, if you, have a mental note be like hey put phone down 30 minutes going to bed exercise early and allow enough time to relax don't exercise and be like okay it's time to go to bed now um you just worked out and took a pre-workout that's not going to happen um get the right time for you to say okay i'm going to eat out here prime example i eat at 4 30 in the afternoon normally on a normal given basis I'm in bed like right now. I'm asleep by 8.30. No, I won't do that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but that's just my routine because I work so many hours of the day. Tomorrow morning, I got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Got to do some COVID tests. I won't go to bed till 8 o'clock tomorrow night. It's just We all do some things like that. That's crazy. Uh, and then the last one before the break, ensure, establish a calming pre-sleep routine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't watch the clock. We all have that in our mind. Like, oh, I slept too late. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me wake up. It's only been two minutes. Um, keep constant sleep schedule. If you if you had one to begin with, that's important. When I'm at home, I have a reminder that goes off my phone. It's my old man reminder. It's like your bedtime's coming up. And I I'm I'm that guy. I want to be in bed by 8:55. I don't know. All right. I want to be in bed and get ready to go to sleep by 8.55. Yeah, that's a weird time, I know. But that's Chris Wally. All right, so hey, look, we're going to take 10 minutes. I will see you folks back on here at 10 after 8. It is straight up 8 o'clock, and I will see you back then, and we will continue to go. All right, see you next
All right, everybody back. We good? Somebody can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm not your average teacher. I have to kind of make it entertaining. So not only for myself, but hopefully for you guys too. So I hope I don't like what's wrong with this guy. Yeah, there's something wrong. But all right, so we talked about that one. That's fine. Why it's not going. All right, look, next. All right, so disease prevention and health promotion. Okay, so obviously we've all just lived through this pandemic and we're still trying to figure out what the hell is going on. We, we don't know. The CDC know, we don't know. We just, we just do these days. Um, so disease prevention, we wanna focus on medical care and prevent to avoid, and prevention to avoid uh, the effects of disease. So what that means is we don't wanna just, like, we don't wanna cross contamination. If I'm sick, I need to wear a mask to protect my patient. Like before the COVID, you would always, you never saw in the States and other countries that was just common courtesy. You knew if you were sick, you must, well, you would put a mask on. Otherwise you were ridiculed in public if they found out. So nowadays that's because it should have come way before now, but it is more predominant to see people that are sick with a mask on. That's like, look at our cancer patients. They wear a mask all the time, even when they're out and about, because their immune system sucks and they don't want to get sick. So that's what they do. So we want to promote focus on personal practices and social habits to improve one health. Be sanitary, take a shower, wash your hands. It's nice to be clean. Remember that. Wash your dang hands. That's the most part about it all. It's just being clean. Okay. Jesus, why is it not working? All right. So, disease prevention, smoking, vaping, or chewing nicotine can lead to cardiovascular and respiratory illness as well as cancer. Well, we know that. It's all stacked all over all of it. Smokeless tobacco is associated with cancers of the throat, mouth, and pancreas. Whew. Vaping has been shown to cause cardiovascular and respiratory illness and disease. We know that, but we still do it. Oh, I can't. I know I did it too, so I can't really fuss at the crowd. Strategies for quitting. Oh, look at there. Yo. Some of the strategies for quitting products containing nicotine is create a plan that addresses the challenge that may trigger the use of this product and set a date. Tell friends and family and coworkers your plan to quit. I want to quit by this date. You need to hold me accountable. Uh, remove tobacco and vaping products from your home, your car, and work. Work is the hardest part. When I'm at home, I could give two craps less. Out here, I'm like, oh my God, but it's not allowed on my platform. I'm t I personally cannot have vape products out here. You can smoke. You just can't have certain open flames. I just don't like chewing tobacco. Or, or I don't like snuff. And talk to your doctor. There may be some things that, um, like nicotine gum and stuff like that, it can work. Yeah, Joshua, also work does suck when you're quitting. So it, it's, it's, it's challenging, shall I say. Um, picking up uh, nicotine gum, is, it's also expensive. I mean, you got to think, and people, when they quit, it, it's, it's, uh, it's rough. You gain a little bit of weight um, because you supplement eating or drinking or something like that with nicotine. Well, when you ain't got it, you're like, where's the pounds from? I don't know what they, I don't know where they came from. Okay, cool. We we know. Alcohol abuse. We know that guy. I'm just going, I always say there's that guy. It's not saying guy or girl, but acceptable, al acceptable alcohol consumption is the, is described to be one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. Sometimes people will use your buddies too. Be like, hey, you didn't drink today. Let me get your two. According to the CDC, excessive alcohol use causes approximately 88,000 deaths a year. The United States, with an economic cost of more than $200 billion a year for alcohol, 75% of the total cost of alcohol abuse is, is contributed to binge drinking. So when I say find another hobbit, a, a hobbit like that, a hobby or a habit. Uh, Chris says, I was the guy until March 13th of last year. Good job, bro. I, I get it. I know it's, it's quitting that habit is hard. 
Uh, so drug use. Um, some people hide it. Some people take medicines off the truck. Eventually they cut caught, go to rehab. Some people serve some time. Uh, both prescription medications and illegal or illicit drugs may be abused or misused. CDC also says that drug abuse costs the United States more than $190 billion annually in lost work productivity, healthcare, and crime. Many EMS agencies test their employees for illegal and prescription drugs. I get tested every time I blink my eyes. I get tested every four weeks when I show up to the heliport to fly out. I get tested for this year so far, I've been tested six times for my company. Every time I go home about midway through my, my time off, I have to go pee in a cup for them. It's annoying, but it's part of the rules, part of the policy. You want to keep working, you got to do it. Rotate your schedule to give yourself time off. Oh my God, how important is that? It is very important to take your time. Do take your vacations, take your PTO. It's given to you for a reason. Work will be there when you return. If at any point you feel the stress of work is more impediment than you can handle, seek help. Always ask. Infectious and communicable diseases. Hmm, we know about those too. We respond from person to person or one specimen to another. Let's talk about COVID. We have the conspiracy theories and where it came from, how it started, where it goes, little, 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 all that fun stuff. Y'all know that. So that being the point, take care of yourself. Infection risk can be minimized by immunizations, protective techniques, hand washing. Uh, here's some terminology. The pathogen, contamination, exposure, and the proper PPE that is used to prevent exposure to a pathogen or hazardous material. It's the same thing when you're talking about choosing the correct PPE for a, a hazardous material that's, that's over the side of the road. You wash your hands, keep them clean. Don't like, I hate to say that we're away from handshakes because I think handshakes is important in the business world, but washing your hands, keep up on your immunizations. I don't care if you're vaccinated or not, what your beliefs are, I don't care. Stay healthy, limit the exposure. If you know somebody's sick, don't go in there without a mask on. Stay away from their icky, icky blood stuff, their stuff, the blood, body, fluids, tissues, and airborne particles that may be in the area because you know you're like, oh, that guy looks like crap. He bleeding out. Don't put your hands on a patient without gloves on. Always wear gloves. If you don't know this, here are some routes of transmission. So you have your direct contact, inner, indirect, airborne, foodborne, and vectorborne. So there are some ideas right there on the sides of what that means by those five categories. And I gotta take a drink of water, so I'm gonna let y'all read that. So at some point we've all seen those, we've heard those. Needle sticks is indirect. Obviously that's a very, very big reportable incident if that accidentally happens. Uh, Vector-borne transmission by fleas, mosquitoes, you know, you get the, uh, I just went blank of the mosquito virus. What's that thing called? The uh, uh, Zika. What's now? Oh, yes, thank you. Ooh, thank y'all. I was just like, mm, I was staring off in space. I was like, malaria. No, that's wrong. What's now? Correct. So, uh, so you got to make sure you take care of yourself. Wear the materials to keep from getting what's now uh, bitten by fleas. I mean, if you're hunting, I know several hunters has been bit by ticks and they get the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, I know several of them. Uh, I've, so got to pay precaution. There's some cool stuff out there these days to help. Um, uh, if the mosquitoes are around in 100 miles, they're going to come find me. They're going to leave y'all alone. I guarantee they're going to take care of me. Um, oh, oh, hang on. Uh, Rebecca, I contracted Alpha Gal. Wow, that's that's not common for sure. Um, so OSHA has developed, publishes, and enforces guidelines concerning uh, hazards in the workplace. We follow OSHA very, very big out here in the whole industry. 
they are like living documents that we have. They they will show up and check you. Uh, these other ag governmental agencies will check you to make sure you're following by OSHA. Each single EMT is trained on how to handle bloodborne pathogen. You will go over in a later course on how to remove like your gloves. Once you have gloves on, how to take them off without contaminating yourself. Um, the proper way to get blood off your so oh, actually we'll just go over that just a minute. The proper hand hygiene. Uh, the CDC has developed the standard precautions for healthcare workers when you for treating a patient. CDC recommends in 2016 is to assume that every person is potentially infected or can spread an organism that can be transmitted to the healthcare setting. Apply infection control procedures to reduce infection. Um, notify your designated officer. Oh, your officer, if you're exposed. Okay, I know we're supposed to call a cop now. So if you get an exposure and you think you've been exposed to, let's say a TB patient, you have to report that because your agency, <clears throat> excuse me, has to treat you. They have to send you to a facility that you can get the right amount of medicine and or potential blood drawn. So that's important. Make sure you report these things. And if you don't have your proper PPE on, you're going to get in trouble because certain agencies require certain PPEs for certain things. We're going to talk about your donning and doffing. That's putting on a removal of PPE. Uh, some of the most components of PPE or mask I wear full face shield, gloves, and gowns. Now, not every single time that you're gonna look like the marshmallow man when you walk in with the eyewear or the face shield or a gown on. 900% of the time, you're just gonna wear gloves. I had an incident several, several years ago um, that I had a needle stick and um, I had bodily fluid splashed in my face and uh, I, that was a vomit as soon as that happened because I, I, I don't like that. So now I wear uh, safety goggles. They look pretty cool. They look like just regular glasses, like I would be wearing glasses, but they're the on on every time I take care of somebody. I have some, that's what it's on the shore side for me to wear at work. I don't know if I work the ambulance and then I have some that I wear out here. It's just for precautionary reasons. Um, and it's, it's just for safety. It's for my safety and your safety. Cause if I get that again, I'm, I may, I may end up hurting somebody cause that was gross. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want your stuff, you keep it. That's yours. So the proper and the most professional way to wash your hands is it takes at least 20 seconds to wash your hands, rub them together for 20 seconds and we get a pretty lather. Wash hands before and after patient contact. Even if you wear gloves, keep your hands clean. They are the only two hands that you're given when you were born. Make sure that they're yours, keep them clean. So if you don't have running water, you can substitute it with the alcohol gel or, you know, but you, the most effective way out is to wash your hands. Um, there was an inside joke going around our company. One of our medical directors on a big conference call was like, if you just wash your damn hands. So that kind of went around as just keep your hands clean and, you know, clean people don't get sick. Uh, gloves. All right. So we want, now, I don't know about this picture, but that looks a little serious. Uh, that, I mean, I don't know if we're doing like a Sunday afternoon cleaning the house with them gloves on. I, I don't get that. But then you're not going to wear them in the EMS field. You're going to wear just the regular simple uh, nitrile gloves. Uh, pick your size. They have different colors. They all pretty. They find the cool stuff. But you want to change gloves each time you go from patient to patient. Um, they do have vinyl nitrile. Latexes are being phased out because there's so many um, allergies out there with the latex. And even if you think there's a chance for bodily fluids exposure, always put gloves on. Um, even when I'm working out here on the platform, I do have a pair of gloves that stays in my, my shirt pocket. Um, when I'm off, uh, I'm kind of like the, the prepared Annie that you see. I have crap everywhere. But at the same time, as I'm not going to stop on the side of the road and provide aid just because they had a slip, trip, and fall and their car is smoking. I'm, I'm not that guy. I've done it too long to do that. Um, so here we're going to talk about removing gloves requires a special technique. Um, in your book, uh, y'all may want to write this down for a couple of y'all that have not been able to obtain your book yet. On 
in your uh, chapter two, skill drill 2-1 shows you the exact way. So some of the ones that have the eBooks, if you'll also look at that too, it shows you how to don and doff your gloves. Um, oh, I thought it showed it. Sorry, there's your yawn again. Um, eye protection and face shields. They are important and they do serve their time and place when you need them. Um, eye protection keeps blood out of the eyes, other fluids from out of the eyes. Uh, prescription glasses, nah, not really adequate. They do form some protection, but uh, they don't need to be like these glasses you see in the picture. You don't need your chemistry glasses, but you need something. Uh, they do say the full contact all the way around your eyes, glasses, like the chemistry glasses are the best. Uh, some, some companies require it. When you do uh, airway innovations, that you had to have uh, goggles on. Uh, I don't know. I'm fat and I sweat, so uh, that ain't happening. I guess it's in my way. Um, uh, gowns. Uh, it's kind of like your. Uh, you've seen your nurses walk around with the over gowns just to keep you clean. It's to keep all the body fluids off your gowns. Um, always. See number two right there. I'm just gonna tell you in the field. A field delivery of the baby is a beautiful thing. I've delivered way too many that I care to do, um, but it is a very beautiful thing. It is a wonderful thing to bring a, help bring a life into this world. Um, but at the same time, it can be very, uh, let's see how you put this, dirty. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. So you're always going to at least have a gown on. Um, any chance there's a major trauma? Messy. Good job, Chris. The, the dirty may be the wrong word, but it's very messy. Um, I personally, I probably should have worn a gown on major traumas, but I haven't. So I don't know. I'm just going to tell you, it's probably the best thing to do to wear that anytime that you come across major traumas. But again, that's just because the book tells me to, and I have to tell you. Um, so this is a KN95 that you're looking at here. It could be an N95. Uh, I don't um Maybe a, a true N95, I'm sorry. Yes, it's a, the one that you're looking at. I actually have some of these in my office. That's what I'm looking at up here. It is a particulate respirator N95 is what you see in that picture. So these are surgical masks. Um, so they're, they're always the big question out is, uh, well, what kind of mask do I put on my patient? Do I put the surgical mask or do I put a N95? I mean, it's... So what's easiest to do is put a surgical mask on your patient. You put an N95 on yourself. If you suspect the patient has any type of airborne or droplet disease, TB is the worst. Now we're talking about COVID, um, but that's the way you want to do it. You want to put them in a surgical mask and you in a higher respiratory mask. Um, protective eyewear. Uh, we talk about if you need to, uh, we went over that. Um, if the patient needs oxygen, place a non-rebreather instead of a surgical mask on the patient and set the oxygen in the flow rate of 10 to 15 because that is, such, that is a higher oxygen delivery than a nasal cannula. So there's the positive pressure is going to keep it inside that mask and those particular droplets won't come out of that mask at that point. Um, if your company has it and you've been fit tested for certain certain masks and you suspect it, it is very beneficial for you to uh, wear the mask that you were fit tested with. Uh, we have double can respirators out here that uh, we wear if I suspect to have a COVID patient. Um, as of this morning, our facility has tested almost a little less than 3,400 people. Now we've had two non-negatives. Um, they were evacuated off of here and they did test positive on the shore. That's the only two we've had to evacuate. Several other facilities out here have shut down multiple times and I don't know if anybody else knows about the oil field, but it is very, very expensive to shut down and bring back on board a production, a production platform. So these companies really enjoy when you cannot shut them down because it's, it's better money maker. So here's a pocket mask. Um, we talk about this. This is, uh, we'll go over the mask, respiratory and barrier devices. 
this is a pocket mask. It kind of folds up. Obviously, it's built to be in your in your pocket in your pocket. Um, on here, I want to point out too is back valve mask is an aerosol generating producer. So that should not be used when you have somebody that is to be suspected to be a COVID-19 patient. Um, I know we're, you may not know what a bag valve mask is, but we'll go into it when we get into respiratory. But the way that you use it, it's going to promote a droplet to leak outside the mask. So if you suspect that, keep that in your back of your mind, don't use a bag valve mask on a COVID-19 patient. Um, disposable of sharps, you want to put them in a biohazard bin. Um, there's sometimes you can see sharp shuttles, a uh, little box like that's on the screen, but they need to be a hard plastic or uh, I guess that's a hard car, like a disposable cardboard. It's very, I mean, it's a needle's not going to poke through that box, but they have to be closed. Oh, goodness. And disposed in the proper container. You just can't leave an open needle or a used needle on the bench seat of the back of an ambulance or on the ground uh, at a car wreck because you just, your paramedic or advanced started an IV. No, that's neglect. You can get in trouble for that. You have to dispose of that. If I'm using one and I'm on a, on a big trauma call and the sharp sh the sharps box is on the other side of the ambulance, I may look at you as my partner and say, hey, needle is closed, it's on the floor. I don't ever, I, I try my best not to leave open needles. I've never done it and I'm gonna knock on wood because I don't want to do that because that is, that's just, that's gross. You should not do that. Um, let's see, and some of the employee responsibilities, it needs to be a safe environment. Um, they need to follow certain guidelines to set point out there. Um, like the risk of being exposed to communicable disease is a hazard of your job. You know that. You know going into this that you're going to be exposed to different things and potentially can come in contact with uh, communicable diseases that can't be treated, HIV, uh, AIDS, certain things like that. It's just small uh, hepatitis, all those crazy things you're going to come into boats with. You need to know what the agency you work for, what their protocol state for being exposed to an infectious control. And if you don't follow it, they can also say, oh, hey, Chris did not follow the rules set and guidelines. He knew, look, here's his signature on that page that he signed date of hire. He didn't follow it. So, I mean, if he didn't follow, we don't have to pay it. So that's where they'll get you sometimes is you just need to be very careful that you follow the policies and procedures set into your base by your agency. Um, let's see, cleaning and decontamination of the ambulance and equipment. Cleaning the ambulance after each use, uh, uh, each run on a daily basis, because what you're doing is you're, you're preventing, you're, you're pre yes, you're preventing cross contamination from one patient to another patient. So just think about this. If the ambulance that came and picked you up from a car wreck and you touched the stretcher and you grabbed onto where the handrails are and you move your hand, you're like, oh my God, there's blood all over my hand. That's, that's cross-contamination and that's neglect. The crew that had that truck should have cleaned it very well. And that's why you wipe down every piece crevy after a call that's a major trauma or any call because you want to prevent that. Now you're like, uh-oh, I don't know what to say because this dude's mad. Well, yes, you're right. And it, you should always clean the ambulance after every call. Stay at the hospital, get your ambulance clean, change the stretcher seat, buckle the seat belts back right. Make sure your equipment is cleaned and tucked away. And it's not going to be a, a missile when you, when you accidentally get, in a, and you get hit by the ambulance and the, the portable suctions didn't come through the little window and smack you in the face. Little things like that. Uh, that's actually happened. I was in a really bad wreck and it came through and hit me upside the head. That's what knocked me out. Um, Because if you clean at the hospital, you can dispose of all the materials right there at the hospital. You ain't got to go nowhere because then you don't have to carry that biohazard crap throughout the rest of the day. And then you're like, oh, man, I know I got to get rid of this big bag.
And most of your ambulance services provide certain type of um, solutions to be clean with. If not, you want to try to mix a solution of one to 10 when it becomes a bleach and water. That is the kind of uh, approved way. And if there is any disinfectants that uh, have the micro bacterium tuberculosis stuff, you can use it. Put your gloves on and wipe the surfaces down. Because over time, dealing with those medicines, I mean, those wipes and those cleaning materials, your hands become super dry and you, and you peel. That's what happened to me throughout time is you just peel a lot. Um, immunity. Even if germs reach you, you may not become infected because you've been exposed to it so much that it's just not going to make you sick. Now, that's not saying that COVID's the same way, but like for a long time, I never got the flu because I was always exposed to it. I was always exposed to sick people on the truck. And people were like, why don't you ever get sick? Because I'm um, always in the middle of it. You tell me. Um, so having been immunized or vaccinated is a big difference. And as it considers into immunity. Able to recover after an infection from that germ can build your immunity if you're like, oh, you know, I got a little sick once I was exposed to the guy. I've tested positive for COVID twice. The second time put me down pretty hard. Um, I was down for about eight days and then I was good after that. Um, there were some, you'll notice there'll be some long-term effects that I, I've noticed since COVID and I've spoken to my physician about. And they're in agreement. It's it's crazy. That bug is it's nasty. Uh, some immunizations we talk about: uh, hepatitis, influenza, which is your flu shots, MMRs. You have your varicella vaccine, and uh, having had chickenpox, tet tetanus, a DDAP, and then your TB skin test. Uh, if you haven't had the uh... yeah, Chris, I've seen that. George Carlin explains germs the best. If y'all haven't had time, look the dude up. It's pretty cool. Um, the tetanus, DDAP, and uh, T, uh, sorry, the TDAP, uh, you're supposed to get that every 10 years. No, uh, uh, just gonna let y'all know. So if you haven't had it, fun times with that. Um, so some just general post-exposure management. <laughs> just... The best, if y'all can see right there, just stay clean. Uh, again, a clean environment's a happy environment. Uh, if it's nasty, it's gonna it's gonna stay nasty. Uh, it's I don't, I don't know how else to tell you besides stay clean. Uh, gross people are nasty. It's it's just to stay keep your hygiene up. It's better off. Um, scene safety, the best thing to do on scene safety is just protect you, yourself, your partner, and the patient. You should always wear your seatbelt anytime you're inside of a mercy vehicle. Anytime you get out day, night, you should always have your ANSI approved safety vest. Like that, I had to do a speech out here the other day about safety vests. You just need to make sure you have the proper PPE on. And those vests, not saying they're going to save your life, but it will help people see you during the dark if they can't, because if you're in a dark blue uniform or your agency is re re retarded and makes you wear solid black and you're in the summer heat of the South. So come on. Um, a lot of times they're talking about, um, what's that say? Uh, place warning devices to alert other motors of the area. Uh, Y'all see the picture. I've never put out a flare. I'm just, mm -mm. I've never done it. I don't know why. That's just, there's police and cops. If they're in a wreck zone like that right there, the interstate's going to get shut down. There's no reason that people need to come back and forth between me. This is not happening. Um, hazardous materials. If you don't have any training in hazmat, uh, here's the best. Oh, wait. Y'all looking at the picture. I need you to see. So that book right there, the ERG, they don't make the physical copies anymore. They make all electronic copies. You can download it off the, off the, the app store or something like that. 
but again they it does cost to get that book i think um i haven't seen one in years so it may just be your best interest to be just knowledgeable about it and have the resource to look it up oh cool ron says the app's still free hey they're helpful you gotta i don't Rhonda, can you tell us if does the app show you how to use the book or is that something you still need to try to figure out on your own how to use it and cross-reference? I keep it Ask Real and CMC on my phone. Yeah, it's a, that Ask Real is pretty good. And if y'all have ever not, y'all ever had to call uh, poison control, use somebody else's phone, don't use yours because it's a mean little joke, but they're a good resource because they'll call you for hours and days on end, even if it's about a patient. Don't call from your cell phone. I'm just telling you a little trick of trade. So electrical, that is way beyond our scope. I don't care. Uh, Chris says, I think you can get them through the local EOC. And that may be something you want to check the emergency operation center. Uh, Rhonda says, it shows you some without the book. You still can buy the book. I'll keep them as volunteer for five, five years of fire service. Cool. Every little tool helps, man. Keep that tool in your toolbox. Um, electrical, don't mess with it. I don't care if you've been a lineman for 20 years and now you're working for EMS service. That is outside of your scope of practice. Not happening. Don't do it. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. They'll call the other professionals. Uh, but make sure you mark it off because if you call additional resources in and they come barreling up in there too, they may not see it and hit it. Um, actually, I just saw the other day, uh, repeat lightning strike can occur. It was a uh, professional boater. He was in a tournament and got hit. within like a couple of years, he's been, his boat has been hit twice. I'm like, there's a sign. Somebody's telling you to get off the water and quit fishing. Um, let's see, some of the fire scenes, I know we may have some firefighters in the area and the, and the class and all that, but if you're on the squad or the, the fire, the ambulance, the box, whatever you call it in your area, and you're just the EMT, that is not your job today. If you're working for the local ambulance service and you go to back up your fire department as a standby, it is not your job to change out their air tanks. It is not your job to help them with stretch the hose because if you get hurt and one of the sirens, they say there's a firefighter down, you can't do mm, because your self done got hurt. So just know your job, know your lane, stay in your lane. A lot of people have trouble with that. Um, some uh, vehicle crashes, it's a lot. That's a lot of EMS, a lot. You have uh, unstoppable vehicles, down power lines, sharp objects. I'm not real sure on what they're referring to your protective gear because uh, a lot of your EMS agencies don't provide turnout coats uh, that I'm aware of. Maybe there are some that do. And I know a lot of services back home that run heavy rescues with a paramedic on it. They do have turnout gear for the paramedic, um, but that's, that's completely different. You know, use them for extrication services. Uh, you may go to some violent scenes, uh, assault, hostage situations, or riots. Once on scene, continue your assessment. Uh, just use personal observations. Be like, oh, that dude looks shady, or that chick's got a bat. And inform other responders that may be coming and maintaining safety to you and your team. If you don't feel safe, please. It's not your responsibility to make it safe. Get out of there. Okay, so... We've seen the riots, we've seen the mass violence. It's not the place for you to stage as an EMS or to go out there and be like, ah, I'm gonna help them. I'm gonna save them if they get hit. It's not, no, it's not my job. Stop, don't do it. Always protect yourself. Allow law enforcement or whomever is there for security to secure that area and, uh, you know, find your cover, concealment, Find something to protect you, period. Um, say recommendations for preventing violence. Uh, you can have training and practices on how to de-escalate certain, certain situations. Uh, and dispatch identification and alert a past potential threat to violence. Some agencies be like, hey, you know, 
uh, the ambulance was ambulance crew was salted here two years ago may come across because it was pre put into the dispatch console. So you'll know some of those prior to being sent to that call or a patient has a history of becoming violent, just things like that. Um, recommendations for protection against violence, uh, escape uh, personal, def personal defense classes, uh, physical and chemical strength techniques on how to use them, when to use them, what to do, how to do it and to do it properly. Uh, fitting and using of body armor. Uh, I've always told folks, your body armor, if you can afford it, wear it underneath your clothes. If you work in an area that you think that's not safe, but every area is potentially unsafe. Uh, protective clothing. Uh, you got to wear the proper gear if it's cold, if it's hot. You don't want to be wearing a sweatshirt if it's like 900 degrees like it is out here. Um, if there's any potential for a, a heat, fire, sparks, or a flashover, you should not be in there in normal EMS clothes. Um, outer layers that resist winds, rain, sleet, and just regular PPE that keeps you safe. I mean, I can't just give you a list of crap you need, but I mean, y'all know you you have an umbrella when you get out your car and go to Walmart when it's raining. Same thing, you can't tell an umbrella as you're walking across the street with a patient, but you can have a pair of frog togs on to try to keep you dry. There's some protective gear that EMS does have. Uh, sometimes you can get firefighter gloves. Uh, there's a helmet, your agency may provide that. And then you can get steel toe boots. Um, they do, they are high ankle boots, so that helps with uh, the ankle protection. And then the steel toes, obviously, to keep your feet from any injuries. But again, depends on your budget and what your agency allows. Like I told you while I go, eye protection. Uh, just pushing it here, ear protection, skin protection, body armor. Um, I'm not, some folks may just have to apply that old sunblock on before they get out there and work them streets. You never know. I mean, they may get, they may be a redhead and burn pretty easy. All right, so caring for critically ill and injured patients. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Uh, I don't want things done to me without knowing what's being done. So talk to them. Be like, hey, bro, just going to let you know. I'm going to put this, I'm going to come back and put a C collar around your neck. I'm going to evaluate you. I'm going to lean you forward. I'm going to check you back. We're going to make sure things are going. Then we're going to put you on a backboard or the stretcher. It depends what we're going to do to you. We may have to put you in this little device it's called a KED. We're going to, so we put it around you. It's going to be uncomfortable for about 10 minutes but I will talk you through it and I'm not gonna leave your side. Talk to your patient. It's just, it's bedside's manners. Don't just go in there and start snatching, moving around because you may cause more issues. You may, you may not listen to your patient enough to know that, hey, they can't really feel their right arm. Why you keep saying, hey, hold my hand. It's not gonna work. So listen to them, let them know Hey, I understand that your right side's hurting right now, but I'm going to grab your right arm. We're going to try to pull you over because I can't just go in there and pick you up and slide you straight. It's just not going to work. It's not going to be comfortable right now, but if you can bear with it for about 30 seconds, I'll have you on the stretcher. Just try to explain to them. Good communications. Ha, ha, ha. Good communications. Don't lie to the patient and don't be like, well, bruh, it's nice knowing you, but in about 10 minutes, you're going to bleed out and you're going to die. So if you got to call anybody, you might want to do that. that. I mean, it's okay to lie to them like that situation, but just be very honest. Always hope. Let them know that there's hope out there. Allow the patient to be part of the care being given, if allowed, especially with children. Um, orient the patient to his or her surroundings. Be like, hey, you may not know where you are. It seems like you were knocked out. Currently, we're sitting on I-65, you know, eastbound. Uh, what's the last thing you remember? And if possible, let them speak to family. Let them talk to family. Like, hey, this is, you know, paramedic Wally with such and such ambulance service. Just going to let you know I have Fred in the back of my truck. He was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Everything's going to be okay. I'm just going to let you know he's going to such and such hospital. Would you like to talk to Fred? 
that lets them know that you actually care. You may not give two craps about them, but let them think that, okay? Um, dealing for children, we'll go over that uh, in depth more into the pediatric session, so I'm not going to go in there. But if possible, you always want an, uh, a, a, say a sane adult ride with them, but you want a caregiver to ride with them. Uh, and they may only be with their like their 18, 19 year old brother, but still that's an, they're considered the adult of the child because parents are, you know, out of town or, you know, two hours away. Um, death of a child is very traumatic. It affects us all differently. And again, it's okay to cry. I've learned that. And now that I can say I've become more emotional in my 40s than I have ever. And I'm like, what is wrong with me, man? Bruh, it's okay. Sometimes that partner just needs that pat on the back and be like, hey, man, I'm, I'm with you. You're okay. And be, you know, be prepared to let the parents know, hey, you need to stop. You need to listen to me. What's, what's, you're not going to be ready to go in there. So sometimes you have to be that preparer for bad news. Um, death does occur quietly, quite sudden. After prolonged uh, terminal illness, um, the EMT will face death. At some point in time, you are going to see it, you're going to deal with it, and you're going to have to confront it. In the EMS world, that is part of your work, period. So there's, <clears throat> I'm knocking on the desk, tapping my foot. There are stages of grieving, denial, anger, hostility, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I will also tell you, if you ever happen to go through a divorce, you will deal with these five stages through the stages of divorce. And again, you may not deal with all five of these as you go through the uh, death and dying and the stages of grieving. I did not go through all of them when my mom passed away. I was just very upset and I accepted it, but I was not anger or hostile. Uh, uh, I, I understood what happened. Uh, I'm glad my mom's in a better place. But you, you know, it's hard to understand, but you, some point in time, you will see all five stages of these. Just part of it. So the EMT's role, what can you do to help? You want to reinforce the reality and be honest and sincere you know it's it's i'm sorry i'm sorry for your loss uh I, I please let us know if we can do anything don't say that you know or understand how the patient or the family feels that is the worst thing that you could ever say casey i'm sorry to hear that bro i'm sorry you lost your father it's it's, it's horrible i lost my mom two years ago february 4th so i get it um be honest again and let the patient or family members grieve in their own. And however they grieve, let, let them do that. It, it's okay to let it happen. If you cry with them, you cry with them. In your book, you're looking at table 2-7. Uh, two uh, this comfort words, um, it, you know, it's one of those you're like, oh, tell me how you are feeling. This is not like kumbaya class, but. There's different ways to deal with it and manage it and move on. Um, hang on a second. Let me look at, hold on, let me look at something. Okay, we're not too far. All right, so EMS is a very stressful job. I don't know how to tell you, it's stressful. Uh, it, it, you, some people are made for it. Some people get in it, love it, live it. And they do 20 some odd years of it. Some people are like, I can't, I can't, I, I love the job. I just can't handle it. And they move on. They, they make great dispatchers. They make phenomenal dispatchers. And sometimes people get out there and be like, oh, I'm tired of doing this. I want to go on to, you know, being a nurse. Oh, well, you don't think that's stressful? I'm just asking a question, you know? Um, so the, sometimes the general, the way to adapt to things, um, the alarms, uh, response, reaction to resistance and recovery or exhaustion you just be i am dead 
I, I'm done. I'm going to sleep. And you sleep for like 36 hours. Some, some signs of stress. Um, you'll notice your blood pressure's up. <laughs> if you ain't got blood pressure, you wait till it now. Um, you'll notice your heart rate's up. You can notice your pulse is up. You'll feel the beating of your chest is a little bit harder. It's kind of like if everybody's dealt with the fight or flight syndrome where the dump of endorphins drop with the uh, epinephrine and it's like, uh, and you just want to, you got to handle it. Uh, you start sweating a little bit more, uh, decreased blood flow to the GI tract. Sometimes you can have a GI tract just go to sleep because it's over stress. You can have a GI upset. It just all depends. So uh, several stresses can affect you in different ways. You handle dangerous situations differently. You're just like, ah, they get me, they get me. Let's go. I've been there when I was in the Middle East. It was like, ah, if they shoot us, shoot me. I'm tired of this. Um, and if you happen to run those calls where you get a lot of deaths, uh, then there may be a lot of pediatric deaths. Or they're like, I'm so tired of running to the nursing home. Everybody's dead on me. What's the deal? I don't. We call it the black cloud. We get it. People in EMS understand, but I don't really know how to tell you to deal with it. Everybody deals with it differently. I don't want to tell you that, oh, this is how you deal with it on every single time because it's it's not. I handle things different than the next guy or the way that you folks are going to handle with it. It's just going to be different. Um, certain triggers, uh, it's kind of like PTSD will set things off, uh, sight, smells, and sounds. Um, there's still certain things, like when I go to the dentist, I have to wear uh, my shooting earmuffs and earplugs because I can't hear the tools hit the tray when they clean my teeth. It's, it's a trigger for me. It sets me off. Um, stressful situations. You have multiple patients that need your attention right now or they're going to die. Well, you can't deal with multiple trauma patients. At some point in time, when you learn triage, you're gonna have to triage your patients and say, if I don't do anything with this patient, they're going to die. The other ones are going to die no matter if I did something with them. Mm. There you go, right there. Uh, it says hospital EMT, ER departments are the best ways to get your trauma experience. Uh, where are you from? Uh, where you say that? What what area? Uh, I know Mississippi. It's we don't paramedics aren't even allowed to work in the ER, which we all think is stupid. But you know, hey, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, that's you're at the what the Med that's up there. Are they still the biggest one. Uh, that's awesome news, though. That's what you can do, man. That's phenomenal. Um, matter of fact, my paramedic, my cardiology clinical was at the Med, and I worked with the cardiologist of the Med and learned so much that he's probably retired and a billionaire by now and I'm still working on the field um so another special stressful situations are angry or upset patients uh family or bystanders man they can make it even worse family sometimes you're just like bro it's not worth it uh here in Dickerson Tennessee they still hire EMTs and e oh that's us that's nice I wish um, some acute stress reactions, uh, they occur during a stress situation, delayed stress, you can manifest after the event to where you're sitting at home and it's like, what? I don't do this, no, I just can't relax. Um, prolonged exposure to it. I mean, this is over and over and over and you just can't, you don't know how to manage it. Uh, managing stress again is an individual thing. You can't be like, this is how you do it. You got to follow step A, B, and C. Now, if you, you need some help, just ask. Let people talk with you. It's okay. Um, physical, physical symptoms of stress. Uh, hmm. Change in appetite, weight gain, weight loss. Hmm. When we know headaches, uh, insomnia, hypersomnia, uh, irritability. Uh-huh. That's a big one. Change in, uh, change in appetites. Some things you may not like. Fear, uh, dull and response behavior. You're just kind of like, mm, it's another person who died. I'm sorry to say that. I feel for them. All right. Complete depression. Over, I can't just see the sunshine over the rain. And when it's beautiful outside, they're like, I just wish it would be dark time. 
I hate it. You know. Um, uh, so you have some agencies that supply critical in- critical incident stress debriefing. It's a very, very important thing to EMS, to fire, to police, that these things are provided. Uh, it is literally, you can talk to CISD, uh, yeah, CISD trained counselors, and there are people that are in the field. It's not like you're talking to some weird stranger. And hang on, I have to take my earplugs out. I want to make sure that you guys can still hear me. Can you all here still hear me now? And I talk like this? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. I had to, my earplugs were dying. Yes. Yes. So, um, talking with the CISD people are phenomenal. Sometimes your agencies may not have them, but they have access to them. So another big company or another big service or a church may offer this in y'all's area. And if your agency doesn't have them and you notice that there's been a big you know, mass casualty incident or you know, uh, a coworker was killed, it may be it may behoove the group to reach out to that facility and see if they can come and talk with you guys so you don't have the the mass exodus of people uh you know when they like can't handle the stress it's 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 good to talk to people man these people are as you can tell i've talked to them quite a few times i guess i'm kind of crazy in my own ways uh so ptsd it affects people in different ways uh, different triggers, different things uh, set people off. This mainly started back when it come from a lot of the wars. People come back and weren't really acclimated back into society, and they were just pushed out to the military, be like, oh, get out and go live your life. It's not really how it happens. And then some of the other things have started triggering into other things. Post-traumatic stress disorder can affect different things. Tamara says, even if it's a coworker, it will help. My guy, my good friend responded to a fire where two children were trapped and she couldn't do anything. Uh, so it was hard for her. just anybody can reach out and just, it's fine. It's good to find the good people to talk to until you find that burnt person, like the person is burnt out and they're like, oh, just get over it. You'll be fine. Well, <clears throat> sometimes it's not. It's, you know, and that person's the one that really should have behooved from the, you know, talking to people years ago. Um, so PTSD is characterized by re- re-experiencing the event and over-responding to a stimuli that recalls the events. So just because like you hear tires screeching may revert you back to a wreck that you were in 10 or 15 years ago that was pretty critical, but it's just that noise that triggers you. Uh, critical incident stress management. Um, you have CISM can occur formally or at an ongoing scene, they can come out there. Trained CISM professionals facilitate, they don't run, they kind of, they don't dictate how it goes, they just overall facilitate the process. Diffusing sessions are held during, during or immediately after the event. Most of the time, they're, if uh, debriefing situations are always 24 to 72 hours after the incident. Uh, if a CISM, is not an option, private counseling by a mental health provider, professional may be preferable. And then some of those services may not even charge you because of what has happened or you're, you know, a a medical provider. They may do it pro bono to help out. I know some people in this category and that's in every category that's out there. It's not just EMS. You know, let's say in the fire service, you got that battalion chief that's been there a hundred years and you're just like, go home. Nobody even wants to hear your voice. You know, back in my time, come on, bro, this is 21st century. And then you have people that don't want to see change because they just don't like change. But it's burnout. I don't guess I really have to tell y'all about burnout because, I mean, y'all, y'all know that. Y'all have seen it. Y'all dealt with people in normal day life that are just burnt out, that they just need that mental break and just something different. It affects, it affects us all differently. 
Uh, it, it can resort after increased medical errors. If they start messing up over time, increased rates of healthcare associated infection and increased patient mortality. They just were like, I'm tired of the system. And they just burnt. I mean, we're losing one of our production team leads. He's been out in the oil industry for 44 years. You think about how long that's been. He started out here in 1976. Whew. That's a long time, so I can't, I, I can't, I can't imagine. Can't imagine what he's seen. Compassion fatigue. It's rough. It's it's out there. Um, sometimes you get stressed. <laughs> Josh, you write lots of crew changes. Whew. You write. So just because I'm listening to your story, I can get fatigued. I can. Because you call me two, three o'clock in the morning for multiple nights in a row because I make myself available to you and still don't do personal health and safety. And it's it's just there. Um, your inability to work in teams, that's some of the symptoms they see. You just kind of like, you don't burn out. You just get that, that blank stare. You're just like, what? I'm here. It's because I'm not, I don't want to, well, what's that? Marshawn Lentz. I'm here because I don't want to get fined. It's the same presentation in a coworker. This is hard. Um, I've dealt with this, so I can tell you responders, uh, risk for suicide, suicide. I've responded to a coworker suicide. Um, it was, she planned it that way. Um, we responded and as we arrived on scene, she, she ended it right there with us on scene. Um, People, people don't know what to do. They, they take their lives in the minute where they're, they're lost. They think that's the only thing that can change the situation is if they remove themselves. That's not the case. Um, the, but that's all that they know. They've held it in for so long. And that's, uh, I despise suicide. I think that's a cowardly way. That's a personal decision. But again, that sometimes that's the only thing that they see. So I understand both sides of it. It's very hard for that person because they are literally so down. That's all that they know is that suicide is the only way to remove the situation. Emotional aspects of emergency care. Um, what's to say? At times, even the most experienced healthcare provider has a difficulty overcoming personal reactions and proceeding without hesitation. The struggle to remain calm in the face of horrible circumstances contributes to the emotional stress of the job. I'll concur to that. Um, I'm not going to say I've seen everything or dealt with everything, but I've seen a lot of things in my time. But there's just sometimes some things that I just I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it. Um, uh, it's You see some things that you're just like, whew, um, uh, uh, and it affects you. Um, you're just, it's a, it's a struggle to stay real, bro. It's the only thing I can say to that one. Huh. Stressful situations. I mean, it's every day of life. Trying to stay calm, trying to stay, you know, cool, calm, collect with crazy people in times of stress. That's important. Uh, just because they dog cuss you and say you're a worthless piece of junk. They they don't mean it at the time because they don't know what else to say. They don't know what to do. So don't take it personal, but sometimes the words that come from patients, family members, or the patients themselves are sometimes hurtful, but they they're lost. So it may take them a little bit. Um Let's see. Cultural diversity on the job, learning things, uh, learning different things about different jobs, different uh, age, disability, sex, uh, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, work experience, education, religions, um, different cultures that are in your area, uh, communications being bi bilingual. That is very important. That's a big thing to do. Uh, and always remain open-minded when you go into a situation. Just because you don't understand it 
doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, certain religions out there don't allow blood transfusions or allow males to take care of females or females to take care of males. You just have to respect it. And if you're on a double male or double female truck and that's the case, do what's best for the patient and call for another truck. Uh, okay, that's okay. Just the way it is. You need to do what's best for that patient. And I don't have a problem doing that. Um, talking about workplace violence, uh, sexual harassment. There's two types, quid pro, quid pro quo, a request for sexual favors, hostile work environment, jokes, touching, et cetera. Always report harassment to your supervisor immediately and keep notes. Uh, because EMTs and other public safety professionals depend on one another for their safety, it is especially important for you to develop a non-adversal relationship with coworkers. But always report any type of harassment because it is not that does not belong at all in the workplace, but it's not allowed at all, should not be allowed, period. Um, substance abuse, technically tobacco, overuse of tobacco is considered substance abuse. It does increase risk on the job. Uh, oh, poor decision making. If you're using an a external substance, uh, you get your fix off of it. You can't let it go. Seek help or find a way to confront an addiction coworker. That's hard. Be like, bro, I know I see you use this. You need to stop it. But that's hard because you have a work relationship with this person. Um, some agencies have EAPs, which is the Employee Assistance Program. Um, they're very beneficial. Ask for help. Ask for help early. The earlier you can get help, the better off you will be. And not just the situation, but it potentially can help other people because they see you as a as a leader reaching out for help. They may be looking up to you, be like, wow, if he can do it or she can do it, so can I. I need help myself. Um, oh, hang on. Um, I think I just went past the hour, but we're almost done. So I'm sorry about that, y'all. So workplace issues. It's one of our last slides. Injury and illness prevention uh, programs. They, each, uh, each company has their own program to identify uh, management and leadership, uh, worker participation. Like we have stop the work programs like PPO cards. Uh, Josh, if you know what I'm talking about there. Hazard prevention and control. Uh, listing hazards in the area and in your workplace. They may have a new chemical plant being built in your area if you're a local responder and they may open the plan up to first responders to come get an educate, I mean, a uh, overview of the facility and know where certain things are. That's very beneficial. Uh, programs evaluation and improvement, they may do like a uh, audit of your work so they can give you a um, evaluation to where you can get a, either a raise or a promotion. So that's part of that. Um, guys, that's the end of the class. Um, I, I don't believe in just talking and talking and talking to hold you for hour for hour. Um, it's 9.15. I'm going to click to the next slide in just a second. It will post the uh, code for this class, um, which you, again, will need to go and put into the class attendance. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything? You can type it in the chat. You can turn your mics on, and we can talk about it. It doesn't matter. Um, let me see if I can close these out of here. Maybe. Um, well, sorry. I'll type the code in there in a second. But yeah, if anybody wants to talk right now while I'm trying to figure out what's going on, please feel free. We'll... Uh, I don't know how to stop. Oh, well, I don't know how to change it back to the original screen. But does anybody have any questions or anything about that, um, about what's going on moving forward or what to expect or anything like that? Um, I'm not. 
Let's see. So we, so do we have a module quiz tonight? No, you have a chapter quiz. You have a chapter quiz on one and two. Um, that is, so you have two tests or uh, two quizzes tonight. Um, just so I don't, in case I forget, there is your class code. Let me tell you that for your attendance, it is AFJ629. You need to do that. Make sure you go submit your uh, attendance record for tonight so we know that you're present. Um, like I said, your test for the ones that have access to your book, your test will be open here in, I don't know, was that 40 minutes? So, and you have until the night at 11.59 to take your test. Uh, Chris. No. Will the test automatically just pop up or how, how do we get to it? Where do we go to find the tests? Um, that's a good question. Okay, so hang on. <clears throat> Let me figure out how to show y'all my screen. I, I will think I show found you a link. Let me log into my screen and then I will share my screen so y'all can see. Yeah, I think I found a link to it uh, in my email. Yeah, so Rob also sent that out. So you can have, um, hang on, I'm just gonna show y'all if I can. Probably have to stop screen share and then click on share screen again to switch what do it up. See right there. For sure. There it oh, goes. There All right. What do y'all What do y'all see on y'all screen so I can know where I'm at? Your login account. Your login. Okay. So let me make this let me make this bigger. All right. So there's my login. So when I click, so y'all are going to be looking at the instructor view. It's okay, no big deal. None of this has to worry about y'all, but y'all will be this class. And your course, you should be the only one that pops up on y'all. So it's the AA738 Echo. So once you click on your class, you'll bring it up and it'll say launch. I don't know why, it just doesn't already take you. Welcome to Navigate. That's how they run their stuff. Okay, so once you're in here, so look, you see this right here? I keep circling open yes, and get those skills those are the nremt skills i sent y'all in the email also all right so when you scroll down to chapter one you click on chapter one this is all the stuff that i have open i've hidden some things see right here it says chapter one quiz available from 6 uh, july 6 at 10 p.m and it doesn't tell you when it closes but it closes in three days you want to click on that there you go. See right there? You can't take it until it opens. I Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So, yes, it does open at 10 p.m. And the reason why I did that is because class, the later we go, the longer the class will take. It'll be straight up, like, we'll be, I'll be pushing to get things in in four hours. So, once you take your quiz, it pops up. For the ones of you that have not um, got in and logged in, there's been a couple that I can see. I've got, this is, will be everybody within the program. So I'll be able to see. And if y'all see, it tells me how long since y'all logged in. Hint, hint, I do pay attention to this. So when I see that y'all haven't logged in in a couple of hours, you'll be like, oh, I'm in it right now. No, you're not. You ain't logged in in like two days. So <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all on the front end, um, this. This program does tell, it tells me anytime that y'all log in, take a quiz, what your results were. I get an email on it. Yes, it is annoying, but that's the way I have it set up. If you go from this screen to this screen and back to this screen, guess what it tells me? You're going you out. Maybe going cheating. Back in. Correct. I get your screen time. If the program thinks that you are cheating, Guess what it does? It Automatic closes you out. You, out. You, know, you will get an F. Period. No questions asked. I love your faces, and I don't know who you are yet, but you are not going to be getting another retake for that. 
and we do that for the benefit of everybody. Like you can see over here on the far right side, these are all the stuff that you're going to have to take eventually. For the ones that don't have in there, you'll have chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a module test. Okay. So if for some odd reason I get a notification that you've been kicked out because they think you've been cheating, I'm going to be setting up a Zoom call. I mean, you're going to be FaceTiming. You feel me? Yes, sir. It's just, it's just like taking an in-person class, except <laughs> you're not in person. We just still hold you to the same uh, responsibility and all that. And I see a lot more things on here than this. This program is amazing. It shows me lots of things. So just because you think you can check it on your phone, guess what? I can tell how long it takes. And it's timed. You get 30 minutes to take your test. Okay, you can also send me emails through here. They show up in here in my email box. I get it all. Um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate. And uh, oh, look, there it goes. There's the no share button. Found it. If you guys have any questions, concerns, or problem, please reach out on the Discord. You can send a private message through Discord to myself or Rob. If you want to email both Rob and I, please feel free. Sometimes I have great communications out here. Sometimes I don't. Um, so that be the case, if something happens and it's a, oh, crap, I can't teach, you may get to see Rob's beautiful face or hear his wonderful voice tonight. So, But I do my best to teach every single night and to be here because I like being a part of the class. I like being up on everybody's information. Um, blah, blah, blah. let's see let me catch up on here Samantha I don't see all that on my screen maybe it's because I didn't add yeah you need to put the class code the AA code because now I have access to all the advanced and paramedic and instructor stuff so that's the reason why you just need the AA code are there any practice tests before okay so Lisa we talked about that there is a current in-person class that is also being taught to where some of the students there can also bounce into the virtual class so myself and that instructor spoke about doing practice exams. But the problem is, is there's only a certain amount of test bank questions. We're still bouncing that to where I think there is one on chapter one. And chapter two, I think I've added uh, room to do a practice exam. Uh, while we're looking, I'm scrolling in here to check it out. Uh, let's see. So there's one. No, I don't know. Um, I think I took it out, to be honest to you. Um, so we don't know. We, we want to add that in there, but we're going to have to figure out how to get different test banks that we can choose from. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, Linda says, how many questions each test? Um, depends on the chapter. <laughs> Sometimes they're 10 questions. They may be 12 questions. I haven't said anything higher than that. Um, your quizzes are 50. Um, let's see. Let me make sure scroll up. I'm not forgetting y'all's questions. Um, Samantha, I can't figure out how to go back and do that. Ah, uh, maybe a Rob question, Samantha. Shoot him up on Discord. He can help you out there. And how do we put in the attendance? If you'll go to the Aries website, stand by. Let me open it up so I can tell you that. So when you go to our website, um, you will click on the EMS Academy where it says Aries Virtual Classroom. And then it's right there on the page and it says attendance form, first name, last name, your email. Did you attend the live or recorded class today's date? Uh, the original lecture class. So if you missed today and you watch the video, so today would be the original lecture class and you watched it on the seventh. The class pin and that's the two pins that I provided to you. And then you do a little virtual signature. Uh, all right, so I think I've answered everybody's questions. Does anybody else have any cool things they wanna ask or go over? I'm good. Answered my question, thank you. Yeah, and please don't hesitate to shoot me a message. Um, guys, uh, I do try to make myself available at all times. There are some times that I will let y'all know in plenty of advance that 
it may be on a Thursday. I'll be like, hey, I'm disconnecting from all of my stuff. So if you need something, please shoot it through Discord and Rob will help you. And Rob will know in advance or some of the other instructors. Uh, I try to focus some mental health when I get home sometimes. All right, folks, I'm going to shut up and let y'all have the rest of your evening to try to figure out this navigate and take your test at 10 o'clock or y'all can wait until tomorrow. Please let me know if you have any questions and it was a great first night of class. I hope y'all got some things and, and enjoyed it. And I will talk to you folks Thursday night. Thank y'all so much and have a great evening. Later, dude. All right, later. Have a good one.